Hello and welcome to the 2021 Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Virtual Production Meeting. My name is Jason Kelly and I'm the Wheat and Feed Grains Extension Agronomist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that today's program counts as two and a half CEUs for certified crop advisors and Arkansas agriculture consultants. Please remember to, that to receive full credit, you will need to stay until the very end of the program. If you have questions uh, about credits, contact Jerry Clemens at jclemens at uaex.edu or myself. For those who are new to our production meetings, we hope this event is informative and helpful. We also want to welcome everyone who has attended our in-person production meetings in the past. COVID has changed how all of us work, though we'd rather be meeting with you over barbecue and catfish, we had to adapt to the new environment of social distancing and in-person meeting restrictions. We've worked hard to convert our county production meeting experience into a series of virtual events. We hope the virtual version will be as helpful as the in-person meetings have been. Today, we have five presentations from our research and extension programs. Each presentation will be followed by an opportunity to ask questions and please use the Q&A panel uh, at the bottom of your screen to submit your question anytime during the presentation. I'll kick off the program today with a presentation on corn and grain sorghum hybrid recommendation and production practices. Hello, my name is Jason Kelly and I'm the Wheat and Feed Grains Extension Agronomist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture and welcome today. I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about corn and grain sorghum hybrid recommendations and production practices for this upcoming year. You know, I think most of our producers are glad that 2020 was over with. You know, if you look back at the corn prices over the whole year, uh, you can see we had a lot of low prices. $3.25 to $3.50 was pretty much the norm throughout, throughout most of the growing season. We get to harvest, we got a little bit of an uptick in price and, and definitely at the end of the year, and all commodities have as well. So corn, grain, sorghum, soybeans, you know, we definitely see an increase in prices. So that's got a lot more interest in uh, this coming year. And uh, I think a lot of our producers are ready to get, get into 2021 and, and have a great year. So one of the things that uh, really sets the tone for yield potential and, and overall profitability is hybrid selection. You know, nothing, nothing new there, but, you know, pick, picking the right hybrid for the right situation, finding ones that are going to give you that high yield year to year, that, that's the challenging part sometimes. So, you know, today we'll talk a little bit about some hybrids, talk a little bit about some green snap and lodging ratings. Those are, those are two things that we typically have potential reduced yields in corn, green snap especially. So if we can avoid some of those hybrids that have problems like that up front, that, that in the end, that's really what we need to do. We also need to look at some hybrids that are 112 to 120 day relative maturity. You know, we can grow some hybrids that are shorter season than that, than that but typically we're just not gonna have that yield potential as some of those more full season hybrids, especially in our irrigated fields. We also need to keep in mind we, we still do have refuge requirements if we're growing BT corn and so most of our hybrids and the technology we still are required to have a 20% refuge requirement so, so keep that in mind and also maybe not necessarily part of hybrid selection but uh, what uh, insecticide seed treatment you get on the on the hybrid you end up choosing is also important so you've got in the past, we've had people plant into cover crops or reduced tillage type situation where maybe that lower rate of seed insecticide was not adequate. So if you're planting in those situations that say, for instance, as a cover crop, uh, maybe increasing that seed insecticide rate up to that 500 level might be beneficial for you. So if we look at uh, hybrid maturity and how, how that impacts you, we, we've done some work. This is some work we did at Mariana from 2016 to 2018. And this was really in more of a, a standard production practices. In this instance, we had 38 inch wide rows. We furrow irrigated the plots. 
and planted all the hybrids at 34,000 seeds per acre. And uh, down here on the bottom, we have relative maturity. So everything was constant. The only thing we changed was the relative maturity here. It's from 77 all the way out to 120 day hybrids. And I've got this red bar here, just kind of highlighting where yields probably start to level out. And you know, if you look at that 112, 114 day hybrids and up probably is where we would get the greatest yield. Uh, we only had, this is all out of one company, so I think maturities should be relatively consistent. Uh, each of these, we only had one hybrid, so not to say that the 120-day hybrid is going to yield less. This, that particular hybrid just uh, we're, we're, didn't quite have quite as much yield as 117, but you can see, definitely see that trend. So, you know, I get a lot of producers say they want to start earlier on harvest, maybe pick 10 or 20 percent of their acreage and plant one 110, 112 day hybrid. And that makes sense, especially if getting started trying to get uh, corn out ahead of rice or plant soybeans. So that makes a lot of sense. So, but our full season 114 and up is probably where our main or highest yield potential normally is going to be. So green snap. Is, is another thing we also need to take a look at. This is a, a photo out of some of my plots a few years ago. And, you know, we know there are some hybrids that have this problem. And so, you know, green snap, wind comes through after the growing point is above the soil surface. And uh, right there at those nodes, in this instance, it snapped off right at the soil surface. Sometimes it can be up higher, depending on what, what the crop stage is when the wind occurs. But you know, those plants laying on the ground are done. And so in this instance, you know, we had hybrids out in this, this hybrid trial that uh, made 240 bushel, absolutely no green snap, no problems at all. This, this hybrid here, we ended up maybe about 20,000 plants per acre. And, and right off the bat, we were limited ourselves to about 175 bushel in this instance. So 240 bushel, good hybrid versus one that had some green snap potential. Uh, you know, that, that, that large of a yield difference is hard to overcome. So we can have some green snap insurance, but, you know, to me, it's a whole lot easier to avoid some of these hybrids that are known to be green snappers and uh, just avoid that problem up front. In 2020, we also had some lodging problems. You know, about every year we may have a little bit, especially if uh, some storms come through sometime during the season or if uh, harvest is delayed and, and 2020 was no exception. So we had 20, uh, two storms that come through, Laura and Beatty, you know, brought some wind, especially in South Arkansas, wet soil. And of course we had some lodging from that. So we also had a lot of late planted corn and later planted corn is typically taller. And so to me, probably a little more prone to lodging. You know, we had some instances where the plant population was pretty high. So that's also another factor that can increase lodging. So, you know, to me, we had a perfect setup for some lodging problems. And if you go across the, across the state back in September and see all these lodge fields, you can see one across the road, it didn't have any problems. So you, you knew it was very hybrid dependent. And uh, fortunately for us, I guess yield trials were impacted, but uh, the best part about it, we were able to pick out some hybrids that uh, just not going to be able to stand if they're left out in the field and have some wind. And this is a trial, kind of what I'm talking about here. This is a, a hybrid trial at the Southeast Research and Extension Center near Rower. And this trial that I'm outlining here with the cursor, this is all, it was a hybrid trial, same plant population, uh, same fertility, same everything, but you can, you can see some hybrids out there that uh, just didn't want to stand very well. These are four row plots, but if I'd had a whole field of these, you know, some of these would have been on the ground. And you can look out in our border plots, border area back here, uh, stood great. So definitely we know that there's a lot of differences in hybrids. So if you go get on the ground and, and really try to walk through some of these plots, a hybrid here on the left stood perfectly, absolutely no wind damage, no lodging. Uh, if you look at that, you think, man, there wasn't any storm that came through. You go four rows over and you, you get a plot you can't hardly walk through. So knowing which hybrids can stand uh, to, to me is, is, you know, the key to, for getting optimum yield to, of course, uh, maximizing your profit. So in this instance, you know, the hybrid on the left, I think it made about 240. And the one on the right, we just couldn't get it all picked up. And of course, it was one of the lowest yielding hybrids in that trial. So 
Lodging definitely is something we want to try to avoid. We also, uh, over the few last few years or several years, you know, our corn plant populations have been increasing. And I think in general, that's one of the reasons how ways that we have increased yields. So, you know, 28,000 is, is probably on the low end now, and there's a lot more corn planted at 36,000. So, but there were one of the downsides to increasing plant populations is lodging potential. So this is a trial we had, uh, this was adjacent to the one we just looked at. This is at the Southeast Research and Extension Center at Rower. Had four hybrids here and five plant populations. Some were really, really low, 12,000, all the way up to 42,000 plants per acre. And so these hybrids, and this is where I've got outlined in this red box, go all the way through. So hybrid one, uh, all goes all the way through here, starting here, all the way back here. So if you look down, go down this line, hybrid one, really no lodging problems at all. Hybrid two, as we increase that plant population, we definitely ran into some problems. So that's one thing we, we got to keep in mind. There's certain hybrids that, uh, you know, the ones that can't stand, you know, that those are the ones that we probably don't need to go real high on the plant population. So just keep that in mind. So if we uh, take just a couple minutes here and we talked a lot about some hybrids, you know, ones to avoid or some, some of the particulars about them. So what I want to do now is just go through some of our hybrid testing results. And this is our, what I'd call the OBT, the official corn hybrid performance trials. And so, you know, typically we always want to get multi-year averages if we can. And, you know, I know there's a lot of turnover in hybrids and, you know, some of these hybrids, we just don't have two-year averages, but that's that's what I've got up here, hybrids with two-year averages, and this is from an uh, average of our trials at Rower, Mariana, which would be silt loam soils, and Kaiser, which would be a, a sharky clay. So these numbers here represent an average of six trials, and I've got them in numerical order here, uh, 230 all the way down to 213, so not that much of a spread. So a lot of these hybrids on this chart will yield well, uh, but there, there are some differences out there in how they're going to, with the green snap potential and lodging. So uh, top here, we'll just go through some of these. DCAB 6595, it's, uh, you know, I was a little bit surprised that it was up at the top on this chart. You go back and look, it stands well, low green snap potential, consistent. So that, that's really what we're looking at. So 230 bushel. Next one, uh, DCAB 6869, same yield but it's one that, uh, you know, if I was going to grow it, I'd want to plant it early. It tends to get pretty tall. Uh, it does have a little bit of green snap potential. So, you know, there, that would be one that you just need to be aware of that. DCAB 7027, been around three or four years, maybe more than that. It's always been pretty consistent for us, a full 120 day hybrid. So that may not be for everybody, but uh, it does have a low green snap potential, it does stand well out in the field and, you know, it's going to give us good yields as well. Uh, DCAB 6253, 112-day hybrid, probably a replacement for the DCAB 6208, which had been around several years. 6253, uh, low green snap risk, stood pretty well this year. So it, you get those two combinations and it stood uh, the yields up there as well. Pioneer, the 1464 and 1847, both uh, yielded very well, low green snap risk. I would probably tend to plant them a little bit early. They can get tall if you plant them in the May. And um, you know, those two are, are ones that if, if I had to had options on which hybrids to get out early to harvest early to avoid some late season lodging, you know, those would be ones I'd try to get out early as I could. Good, great yield so. Uh, DCAB 6599, a newer one, 115 day hybrid. Uh, a little bit of a green snap potential there, and our trials still up there, 227 bushel. Agri Gold 6544, 112-day has been really consistent in our trials for the last four or five years. Uh, not much green snap potential there, so we've got good yields. Local 1577, 115-day, same thing. Uh, you know, north to south is one that does perform pretty consistently for us. Agri-Gold 6659 and our Dynagro 57VC51. Those hybrids have been around, gosh, I'd have to go back probably seven or eight years, maybe longer than that. And they're still, 
still widely grown, still one of our yield leaders. Uh, both of them stand well late season. Probably the one thing I don't, don't like about them, it, they do have some green snap uh, risk earlier in the season. Dynagro 55 VC80 stood real well for us. A newer hybrid, great plant health late season. Uh, stood well, 220 bushel. DCAB 6744. It seems like this one's been the yield leader the last two or three years. You know, getting, maybe not going to say it's getting a little bit of slippage, but it's uh, getting some age on it, but still, you know, really consistent for me. But it is one that uh, if you do leave it in the field, can have some lodging problems later on. Progeny 8116, that was one of the hybrids I had in that plant population study I showed earlier in this presentation that stood well at high populations, stands really well, consistent yields, especially in South Arkansas. Progeny 9117, consistent, uh, you know, north to south, been around several years, good, good solid hybrid there. The same thing on the Dynagro 58 BC 65, 118 day hybrid. Uh, you know, a lot of people have had really good luck with that one and uh, still out there this year. Dyn and also the Progeny 9114, north to south, uh, stands well, uh, will also be one to take a look at. So a lot of hybrids to choose from out there this year. I know, uh, you know, so, some of the, the increase in demand for corn seed may make some of these hybrids a little bit harder to get a hold of if we hadn't already got some booked. We also have a lot of interest in conventional corn. In this past year, I would estimate 15% of our corn acreage was conventional corn, and most of that would have been in Northeast Arkansas and a few areas in Central Arkansas. So I always get questions about what hybrids are available in a conventional version, and that always seems to be a little bit of a limiting factor sometimes, that we do have options. We got a new one, DCAB 6592, would be the conventional version that that would be new for 2021. So that might be one to take a look at if that if the seed would be available. The Agrigold 6659, Agrigold 6572, Dynagro 57, CC 51. Uh, and one that wasn't on this list, wasn't tested in the, the OVT this past year, Pioneer 1870 is also one that's pretty widely grown in the conventional market. So I'd say there's not others out there, but it, the ones that have been tested in our, or the stacked Roundup uh, hybrids that are tested in our OVT, these are the ones that also have a conventional uh, version. So the keys to high yielding corn in 2021, of course, we've got to select the best hybrid for conditions, just what we talked about just a little bit ago. You know, get it planted correctly, and you know, that involves a lot of different things, but planting day, but you know, we don't always have to be the earliest planted to get the top yield. And corn, you know, we can't correct a poor stand. We've got to have a good stand up front to get a good yield. And so Keep that in mind. Don't, we don't have to be the earliest planting, but uh, planting date is early planting is beneficial a lot of years. Uh, we'll hear a little bit about fertility and weed control later in this uh, presentation. Uh, but timeliness of all inputs is critical. And just keep in mind there, there's no one single thing that's going to give you the, the top yield, most profit in 2021. And your yield is really limited by whatever is most limiting. So if you do everything right and you're a little bit late on fertilizer or irrigation, that's going to be your most limiting factor. So, okay, switching gears a little bit, grain sorghum. Looks like we're going to have a lot more grain sorghum in 2021. And, you know, the last three or four years, we've only had maybe, maybe 10,000 acres of grain sorghum in the state, some years less. And if you go back to 2015, we had over 400,000 acres of grain sorghum. You know, that was a huge jump that year. And if you look, go back and look at the markets that particular year, you know, grain, the price for grain sorghum got over $5. Well, today you can sell book grain sorghum for August and September deliveries of 2021 for $5. So, you know, because of that, we're, we are definitely gonna see some more grain sorghum in 2021. So. You know, in this shorter presentation, we can't get into a lot of detail, but planning date is really pretty critical for success in grain sorghum for a lot of reasons. But, uh, you know, when I say early, a lot of times probably depends a little bit where you're at, north to south, but April planted, 
is uh, really probably where the highest yields are. So this is a, a planting date study we did at Mariana over six years. And I've got, uh, we had a lot of planting dates and I've grouped them by April, May, and June. And we have our relative yield potential over here. So if you look at that, it's really easy to see where our highest yield potential was, April. Now we can plant into early May. Uh, some years we may have the yield potential, but if we get into later May, we're, we're definitely not. So. And also insect-wise, sugarcane aphid, headworms, sorghum midge, you know, we have a lot less issues with April planted versus May or, or definitely June planted. So we want to plant early, but we don't want to plant too early. So grain sorghum, we, as we know, is not as top, cold tolerant as corn. You know, it's probably more in line on cold tolerance with cotton. So if we're starting to plant cotton, you know, it's time to be planting grain sorghum in most instances. And so. I don't like planting by the calendar. I know we, a lot of times we, we look at the calendar, it's time to plant, and a lot of times it may be, but uh, you know, look, look at that uh, planting window, what that forecast is, what your soil temperature is, you know, ideally 70 degrees, but uh, you know, if it's 60 degrees and we got a good window, three days, seven days, you know, don't have any rain coming, uh, you can get in the plant, that, that's probably going to be a good, good time to go ahead and plant some. Too cool, we get a rain on it. And then we all, we see this every year, we get some herbicide stress. So maybe we put two pounds of atrazine after planting into cold conditions, get a rain, you know, that just leads to problems. Uneven emergence, uneven growth. And, and unfortunately, a lot of that carries through to uneven maturity. And when you're trying to control midge or uh, doing a harvest day. So we want it to come up uniform, grow off uniform. and. You know, putting out two pounds of atrazine right after planting, maybe we need to put to hold back a little bit of that atrazine because we're going to need some later on anyway. So early planting is beneficial, but uh, we don't want to go too early. You know, our hybrid selection in grain sorghum is also very important. So I've got the OVT grain sorghum hybrid performance data from 2020 up here. Now this is just data from 2020. I, I tried to go back and look at two year averages, three year averages, and all of a sudden I've just got three or four hybrids available. So um, we had irrigated trials. We had three trials that were irrigated, two were non-irrigated. So I've got the top irrigated and non-irrigated on this other side here, but a Dynagro M69 GB38 was our top in irrigated 153 bushel. These are small plots, not, not whole field basis, but for sure, but awfully good yields here. Um, fourth over here in the, in the non-irrigated. So, you know, a lot of these are pretty good, probably pretty widely adapted, irrigated or, or dry land. Uh, the DCAB 5101, been around several years, 150 here, uh, fourth and, and fifth in the non-irrigated. Uh, some others that, uh, were not tested in 2020 that are, are probably out there that have been tested in past years. Pioneer 84P80. This is one probably for top yields under irrigated conditions. You know, I think that's probably where I would keep it. Maybe not put it on the, the dry land or the tougher type situations. If you were going to have some dry land tougher, uh, maybe you go with the Pioneer 83P17. Also a newer one uh, that wasn't tested this past year, DCAP. 5407, uh, one to take a look at as well. So we've got some hybrids out there. Maybe the selection is not all that great, especially since we've got a, a huge increase in grain sorghum production in Arkansas, but also Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma. So, you know, we're probably going to be a pretty short supply on a lot of these hybrids. So uh, keep that in mind when you're trying to find some. Also, hear a lot about sugarcane aphid tolerant hybrids, and, and that, that is a thing. And so, you know, we talked about that earlier planting date. Maybe if you're planting early, maybe having a sugarcane aphid tolerant hybrid may not be as critical. But if you're planting in May, especially June, you know, that gives you a little more protection. You still may have to spray for sugarcane aphids, but uh, that just uh, the plant doesn't respond uh, quite as negatively towards the aphids as some of these others. So. If you're a little bit day or two late on spraying the aphids, maybe that's not as detrimental versus the one that doesn't have the tolerance. So there are hybrids that are sugarcane aphid tolerant out there, and I would be looking at those if I were planting late. 
All right, so just a, just a quick rundown on, on some things we can do for successful grain sorghum production. And, you know, one, one thing we, we sometimes forget about is what was in that field last year. So if, in a lot of instances, we're going to be planting grain sorghum on dryland fields that were in soybeans last year, they have pigweed problems. So what do we do to, for pigweed management? Well, we put out residual herbicides. So overlapping residual herbicides. So go back and look, make sure you're not going to have some problems there that's going to lead to a low yield or just a, a, a not successful grain sorghum crop. But plant, get the right hybrid, early planting date. And, you know, I'd like to plant in April for most part of the state if I can, April, early May. Seeding rates, you know, we can run the rates on up, but I think a lot of times it doesn't really help us. So non-irrigated, maybe 60,000 seeds per acre, irrigated 80,000. You know, grain sorghum's got a lot of ability to compensate for thin stands. So balanced fertility, weed control, you know, like everything else, we've got to have everything done right to have a, a good successful crop. I appreciate your attention today. And uh, we're going to have some questions here momentarily, but at first I just want to say a lot of this information you're going to hear today in my talk as well as others was partially funded by the Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Promotion Board, so that's where some of your checkoff dollars were spent. And I've also got my contact information down here at the bottom, and so if uh, you don't get your question answered here shortly, uh, just, uh, I've got my contact info, cell phone, email, call me, text me, send me an email, be more than uh, happy to uh, uh, answer any questions you have. So thank you for your time and uh, talk to you later. Great. Now, after each presentation, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. And then uh, also at the end, we'll have some time for some questions if, if you don't get your question answered. So. Uh, going through the question and answer box, we've got uh, a couple of them here. Um, let me pull this up here. First question was, are, are these slides going to be available in printed form? And so each of these five presentations today and uh, the upcoming uh, other crop production meetings will also be available online. I don't know that they're available in a printed form, but if, if you would like a printed form, I'm sure we could get, get a copy and send to you. But these videos will be available on, on our extension website uh, here in the next few days at once the uh, presentations are all over with. All right, the uh, another question was, uh, let's answer this one here. The question is, have you looked at short statured hybrids? And I, I assume we're talking about short st statured corn hybrids. And so if you read some of the articles, uh, Farm Press or Farm Journal, you know, that that's, that's seems like the up and coming thing, short, short hybrids. So uh, I have not looked at those. And I guess the thought process is if you've got a shorter statured plant, you know, the concept is you're, you're probably going to be planting a lot more seed, have more plants out there, even though the plant, uh, the yield per plant may be less, but if you plant more plants, your yield overall will be going up. So that's, that's something that I imagine in the future we'll be looking at. I know uh, some of the other companies, Stein, uh, I think DCAB, I know they had an article here a while back looking at some of that. So, you know, that may be something that's coming up, but, um, you know, right now we, we have not looked at that. All right, uh, let's see here, another question. What are the acreage expectations for this year? And, uh, you know, if you, if you follow the uh, crop report that came out today on the corn side, it said we U.S. yield was down a little bit this year. And if you look at the markets, uh, at least earlier this morning, they were up quite a little bit. So. Uh, with the pr rise in price there before Christmas, which has continued through today, and we also got the increase in today from the uh, USDA crop report, uh, I really feel like the corn acreage will be up. This past year, we were anticipated to plant about 800,000 acres due to weather and, and probably low commodity prices. We only planted about 620,000 acres. So. You know, even if we were back to where we were last year, we'd be looking at 800,000 range, maybe even more than that, if uh, depending on what the markets keep doing. So, all right. Uh, 
question, another question here, if you get down here. How important is it to plant corn two inches deep? And uh, like I say, in the, the short talk today, we didn't we didn't have a lot of time to go in a lot of detail. But uh, if you guys want to talk a little bit more, my, my contact info is out there. Just feel free to, to hit me up. But yeah, for corn, planting depth is really important. E every year we have some problems that you know a producer will plant. Seems like on maybe some fluffy beds or fluffy ground recently tilled. Uh, we plant maybe inch and a half deep, we get some rains on it, and then all of a sudden what we planted an inch and a half is now a half inch deep or an inch deep. And so we can have some root development problems there that, uh, you know, we just have trouble overcoming. So, yeah, that's one thing, you know, we talk about doing everything correct in corn, uh, planting, getting it planted correctly, getting it planted two inches deep is also one of those things that uh, we, we're just going to have to do. All right, uh, and we got a couple questions here. Uh, one of them, is there any problems with dicamba drift on corn and grain sorghum? And uh, I think I'm gonna defer that one to Tom a little bit later on the program. He can talk a little bit more about dicamba and as a weed control option or maybe in a drift in corn and grain sorghum. And we also have another question probably related to uh, herbicides, Enzyme grain sorghum, what's its, its availability? And Enzyme grain sorghum uh, is herbicide tolerant grain sorghum. It's tolerant to the imidazolinone herbicides. And, you know, that's something new. And so the, the seed for that is going to be pretty limited this year. And so Tom, you may be able to comment a little bit more on that. So, but, uh, okay. Well, I think Currently, that may be all the questions that we're going to answer on corn. And so uh, right now, uh, thank you for the questions. And like I say, if you have more later on or think of something later on, just put that in the Q&A box and we can get to that at the end of the session. Or if we don't get to it, I can uh, contact you directly. So, so now it's time to move on to Dr. Tom Barber, our Extension Weed Scientist, who will talk about weed control in corn and grain sorghum. Hey, this is Tom Barber, professor and extension wheat scientist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Today, as a part of our county winter production meeting series, I'm going to be talking about wheat control in corn and grain sorghum. First, I'd like to take a look at Palmer pigweed in Arkansas, or Palmer amaranth. Uh, as we know, over the years, we've had increased resistance in this weed to several key herbicide modes of action. Uh, from yellow herbicides, ALS herbicides, up to glyphosate resistance in 2010, which was widespread. However, recently, uh, we've identified populations of PPO resistance that are fairly widespread across the state uh, that have occurred since 2015, and those counties are highlighted in red here on the right. In addition, uh, recently, metolachlor resistance over the last couple of years has been found in three counties uh, with pigweed populations there. Now, we don't believe metolachlor resistance is as widespread as PPO resistance, but obviously we are concerned that it is increasing across the state because these group 15 herbicide residuals are what we use to manage pigweed basically through the season right now, uh, at least from a residual standpoint. Uh, in addition, these counties in blue in the map to the top of the slide are pigweed populations that are tolerant to post applications of our corn herbicides or HPPD herbicides. So that herbicide class of chemistry includes herbicides like Callisto or Mesotrione, which is in Halex, uh, or Laudis, uh, Caprino. Common corn herbicides that are used post-emergence, we have populations of pigweed in the state that if all we used were those herbicides, we'd have a lot of failures. And so we, it's really important to know the population of Palmer that you're dealing with on the farm level so you can select the right products and rate uh, to get as good control as possible. In addition, and unfortunately, I, there is something else I want to talk about. Uh, last year, in a couple of cotton fields, I went out to some control failures from glufosinate. 
Uh, this came from Northeast Arkansas, went out, sampled the fields, uh, sprayed a little Liberty on top of those pigweed. And then I wrote a blog article about not seeing much control out of my dousing of Liberty in the field. And so we collected seed from those populations and they were currently growing in a greenhouse at Fayetteville. As, as you can see, our first rate titration study uh, is very concerning here. And so this is rates of Liberty uh, from 16 ounces, 32 ounces, up to 256 ounces, which is a, a very high rate, 8x rate of Liberty here in the tray to the right. And we still have survivors. And so obviously this causes us great concern uh, especially in cotton, we've relied on glufosinate heavily uh, for palmer pigweed control uh, since the widespread occurrence of glyphosate resistance. So uh, we're following up with these pigweed populations. Right now we have three in the greenhouse that we're concerned about. We're continuing to do rate titration studies, uh, but it looks like at the very least we're going to have some increased tolerance in a couple of populations uh, there with Liberty or glufosinate. So it just drives home the point uh, that we've been talking about for several years now. We've got to diversify our systems. Uh, when we're talking about Palmer pigweed, we can no longer talk about a herbicide only approach. Uh, herbicide is the easy answer, but it's not going to always work. And right now it's not the best answer for the way our pigweed populations are going in Arkansas. So incorporating a systematic approach using several cultural and mechanical methods are going to have to become our foundation, unfortunately, moving forward, at least into either new technologies with new herbicide modes of action uh, are developed. And even then, to protect those new technologies and herbicides, we're going to incorporate or we're going to have to incorporate these cultural practices. Now, since this is a corn talk, I'm not going to talk about a lot of these, but corn is, is a good crop rotation for us in the fight against pigweed because we can use several different herbicides in corn that we cannot use in other crops. So uh, that's a benefit for corn. Being able to plant earlier is a benefit for corn. Uh, you know, sanitation of our non-crop areas and equipment is important regardless of which crop we grow. Cleaning that equipment, cleaning up our turn rows and ditches and equipment yards uh, is crucial to, to reduce the spread uh, on our farms from field to field. Uh, optimizing application rates of herbicides, that's crucial regardless of the crop we talk about, and seed bank management. Now we can't uh, focus much on harvest weed seed control at this time in corn, but what we can do is once we harvest that corn crop, we can make sure that any pigweed that are left uh, don't go to seed, or if they've gone to seed, we remove them out of that field. And so uh, we need to really in our corn rotation focus on not allowing leftover pigweed go to seed uh, following corn harvest and take whatever steps necessary uh, to clean those fields up. So particularly uh, in corn weed control, we can plant early and that's a benefit, especially when we're talking about Palmer pigweed because we can plant prior to a heavy germination window of Palmer amaranth or, or pigweed. So planting early is a huge benefit for us in a, in a corn weed control system. We know we can lose yield early on if, we, if we're not careful with corn. You know, that first eight weeks is gonna be critical uh, to make sure we maintain our weed control. We need to consider including residual herbicides. And, and I think most people use it in season. Uh, what I mean here is maybe consider using that residual herbicide at burn down uh, to carry over into the season because everybody wants a one-shot program. And a lot of times there's not a one-shot program that fits everything. But in my opinion, we've got a better chance to use a one-shot post if we include a residual with our burn down. Verdict uh, fits that window well, especially from a pigweed management standpoint. A lot of broad leaves helps us with winter annual, annual burn down for about everything that we're dealing with at that time, other than ryegrass. And if we've got a bad ryegrass scenario, we might want to consider lead off at planting or, or at burn down. Uh, rim sulfuron, which is in lead off, has pretty good ryegrass activity as long as that ryegrass population is not ALS resistant. Uh, we do know that one-shot programs can fail. And like I said, I think that's the preferred uh, approach to corn weed control is getting it all done at once, but it can fail for several reasons. The first reason it can fail is just applications that are not made timely. Timely applications are key to success. 
Product selection is key to success. Using multiple modes of action in that herbicide mix is going to be key. Use the appropriate rates based on soil type. A lot of growers want to reduce the rates if they're mixing multiple products together. For Palmer pigweed, that's not what we need to do. We need to keep our rates high and uh, use multiple modes of action. And this is just a data set taken from uh, last season, 2020, in Mariana, Arkansas. There's nothing special necessarily about this data set. Other than we're just looking at pre-only post pro or pre-only programs versus post-only applications. And so these are one-shot programs, pre or post, blue bars or pigweed control, orange bars or barnyard grass. This is end of season rating. So in September, right at harvest, we looked to see how good of a job we did uh, and what we had left in the field. And as you can see, for the most part, uh, statistically, these programs are gonna separate. We had some, control pigweed a little bit better than others, but most of them left some pigweed in the field. We had some control grass a little better than others. The worst on the barnyard grass was the pre-only application of Resicor atrazine, and you'll see that here in a minute. Just not a lot of residual there uh, to help us with the grass season long. So when you look at the data, there's not a lot of difference there, and we probably preserve yield in this scenario, but we're also leaving things to go to seed at the end of the year. And if we just take a look at what that looks like, uh, again, these are our one-shot pre programs So at planting, we tilled these fields and planted into freshly tilled beds, put the pre's out. Untreated on the left, and then our then this first plot is just two quarts of atrazine, two pints of dual. That's two pounds and two pounds right up front. It's, it's very cheap. We're, we've done a good job preserving yield, but we're losing it at the end of the year, and we're gonna have morning glories, pigweed, and grasses left when we go in to harvest that crop. Uh, when we include more modes of action, such as inverted zidua with the atrazine, at the time of this picture, again, we're still pre-tassel here, but, but uh, excellent weed control. Vertic at 10 ounces plus zidua without the atrazine. Good job, we've maintained our yield most likely. We've got some weed starting to emerge, so it's not gonna be as robust as if we had the atrazine in that. Uh, Corvus Warren atrazine. This is similar to a bear type program. Again, a lot of grasses that have broke, scattered pigweed, morning glories in that plot. And this is the one I showed you that had the really poor barnyard grass control later on. Uh, Resicor atrazine, that's not one we want to include up front as a pre-only program. And the last one, and here's a check again, but last one is Acuron XR plus atrazine. Again, decent, very similar to the the verdict zidioatrazine we saw earlier. And so what about post? And these are all, we're all applied at V2. Uh, again, these are just kind of uh, not necessarily company programs, but programs I hear a lot of people putting out and going to in corn. So uh, Caprino warrant and atrazine plus Roundup. Again, at V2 to, to where we see this picture, uh, very clean plot there. The Resicor atrazine roundup looks a lot better in that early post window than it looked from a residual pre standpoint. Uh, the Zidua atrazine roundup, really good there. Armazon Pro atrazine roundup. You know, the one thing about the Zidua atrazine roundup is it doesn't have that HPPD, which can be important if we're talking about morning glory, residual morning glory control. And we don't have much morning glory in this plot, but if we did, we'd see morning glories escaping that pretty quick. Uh, Armazon, Atrazine, Roundup, again, pretty clean plot there. So not a whole lot of differences. And here we have the Acuron XR uh, Atrazine. See a few escapes maybe, but overall pretty decent weed control there. Um, again, regardless of program, we can do a good job. We can use several different products. The trick is making sure all the modes of action are there in all, in all those mixes. And what about yield? If we look at yield from this, the chart on the left is yield from our pre-only applications, chart on the right, post-only applications. If we just set a 190 bushel, 190 bushels, we had more uh, in our post-only programs, higher than that than we did the pre-only. And you can see where we lost some of that grass control. And grass is highly competitive, especially with a grass crop like corn. So uh, we wanna make sure we maintain that grass control everywhere we we lost a little grass, we, uh, we lost a little yield. So uh, again, uh, the post programs in this particular example or one year data set look good. Now I have seen it not look this good 
when we delay to V4. So going in and hitting that timely application is key uh, to making that look good. And it all looks a lot better than our untreated here that's down around 140 bushels. What about if we're uh, in a county that has these multiple resistant pigweed populations? And this is some data from Marion, Arkansas in 2019. This population of pigweed is HPPD, uh, dual, PPO, glyphosate, DNA, and ALS resistant. So it's resistant to all those things I listed earlier. Uh, but, you know, and this is, these are pre-only programs I'm showing you uh, versus our untreated Acuron and Accorda Atrazine. Again, one shot's not going to clean all that up. We protected yield likely, but, but uh, we're going to have a lot of pigweed go to seed in that scenario. Corvus Atrazine, more pigweed than in the previous plot we saw, and then Verdict, Zidua Atrazine, all that planting still looks good at this point. Uh, later in the year, we likely have escapes here. So again, it's important in a system where, or in a situation or field where you have multiple resistant pigweed, it's important that we use, I, in my opinion, two applications and, and multiple modes of action in each one in order to maintain control season long. So just to wrap it up on corn weed control, again, plant early if possible, as early as possible from, a, from my standpoint, a weed control standpoint, include a residual, uh, at burn down if you can. And I like verdict in this window. Again, it takes care of a lot of our winter annual mixes, uh, especially we put it with Roundup and some MSO. If we have ryegrass, you might want to consider lead off in that window with that, help with the ryegrass control. If you're trying for a total pre, uh, three herbicide modes of action are going to be necessary up front. Don't skip on the rates. Uh, I think a total post is probably going to be a little more successful than a total pre if you get in there timely and make that application before the weeds get too big. Um, include multiple modes of action in the mix. Uh, I still think atrazine is going to be the backbone in that total post and we don't need to skip on those rates um, and, and or of anything, much less atrazine. But I still believe, and I've got data to support this over long-term studies, that two apps are really better than one. So putting out something free or in with that burn down and then coming back in 12 inch corn prior to our atrazine cutoff uh, is gonna be key, I think, in most systems to maintain the season long control and have few pigweed to deal with uh, late season or fewer pigweed to deal with after harvest. Uh, and the big thing is destroy the leftover pigweed following harvest. It's not gonna be perfect, Never, no system's gonna be perfect but uh, we need to make sure we're not adding that seed back to the seed bank because it's just going to lead to trouble uh, further down the road. A few new herbicides I want to talk about that are registered for 2021. Uh, the first one's Reviton. It's a PPO herbicide, Typhenicil, very similar to Sharpen. Uh, it's right now it's registered for burn down and crop desiccation. I actually believe for soybeans anyway, it may be a better desiccant than Sharpen is right now. Just looked at it one year, so we don't have a lot of hard, fast data on it. It's just something that's new that I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, plant back intervals, if we're using it for burn down or you're trying it zero days for corn and wheat, 14 days soybean and cotton. Again, I compare it very similar to a sharpen in, in that burn down window uh, without residual. It doesn't have the residual that, that sharpen has. Uh, Sinate. Sinate is a premix of blue phosphonate and tripramazone. This is a corn herbicide from AMVAC, uh, registered for Liberty Link corn or corn with Liberty tolerance. And that's the biggest key uh, to this herbicide is don't spray it if you don't have Liberty tolerance in your corn hybrid, or you're likely gonna be replanting that field to something else because you're gonna kill it from the Liberty. But make sure it's resistant to Liberty prior to application. It's a very hot mix, especially with a quart of atrazine. So a quart of atrazine plus Sinate, Excellent treatment post-emergence uh, for, for all weeds. Uh, adding a residual group 15 can help, again, extend that residual uh, from just the Senate and the atrazine. But, but again, uh, it's going to be new out this year and an option for us in corn. Tough is a, another new herbicide registered in corn, uh, Pyridate. It's a PS2 inhibitor in the group 6 category. Uh, registered again in corn. It's not a standalone product. This is not something that uh, we're just going to read. We're going to recommend by itself. It can increase control of, of broadleaf weeds 
we had it with atrazine plus an HPPD, it may bump control a little bit. We've seen it bump it. We've seen it uh, not add a lot sometimes, but if it's going to add, it's going to be in that situation with other herbicides. Uh, it needs atrazine or HPPD in the mix, probably both for the best results. And there's very little residual to it, but you'll probably hear something about tough uh, and it will be in the MP44 this year. Grain sorghum weed control, uh, shifting gears just a little bit. Uh, the main key in grain sorghum weed control, number one is make sure that seed is concept treated. I don't know that we can get it not concept treated, but just double check and make sure that it is. Uh, in a grain sorghum system, if you haven't grown it in a while, the pre is crucial to success, especially when we're talking about grass control. And so at a minimum, dual two magnum, one to 1.3 pints pre uh, is where we need to be. If we don't do anything else, that needs to go out pre. I, I know a lot of folks that will put it with a quart of atrazine, okay? Or we can use 10 ounces of verdict. We can use uh, several different products pre uh, anything with mesotrione or callisto in, uh, not anything, but a lot of products are registered pre, uh, but post you're going to get a lot of injuries. So this is in a pre only uh, application timing there. Uh, atrazine plus dual post, that's the base. Um, and then you can add husky for bigger broadleaves, especially morning glories and pigweed, uh, facet for small grasses. Uh, Gambit, I don't have it listed here, but Gambit's also an option for morning glories and, and sedges and other broadleaf weeds, uh, but not pigweed. So uh, it just kind of depends on what you have there. Uh, I would say if you have heavy grass pressure or you know you're going to have some Johnson grass or Texas panicum, I'd consider the Enzin grain sorghum system for those weeds because we have no answer for Johnson grass and Texas panicum in grain sorghum at all, pre or otherwise, really. And so um, you need to make sure you know what's in that field before you drop some grain sorghum in there. But just, just to show you that uh, we do get good control with Johnson grass with the Enzyme system using zest herbicide, which is Nico sulfuron, uh, only can use it if it's tolerant and zest, or I'm, excuse me, Enzyme grain sorghum is tolerant as well as a new system called the Agro system from Alta Seeds. Uh, technically, they're going to have a different herbicide, a different NECO registered, but it's basically the same type system. We're using to control Johnson grass populations, and it helps with other grasses as well. And so uh, just to show you what this can look like and untreated on the left and on the right, we have, uh, we put out dual pre and then followed it with zest, atrazine, and dual magnum post. And again, we can make a good program around that Enzyme system, even if we have Johnson grass. But my thought is if you know your fields eat up with Johnson grass, probably don't plant grain sorghum there anyway. It would probably be the best road to take. And with that, I'd like to wrap it up and uh, acknowledge the Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Board here. We appreciate their support and funding each year. It enables us to do a lot of these different uh, herbicide program uh, scenarios that I showed you today. Uh, my contact information is, is here on this last slide, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions uh, when we get to that question and answer session. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Tom. Um, I, I tell you what, let's on your questions, we, there was a couple of them that were, uh, I think you touched on a little bit. First one was uh, dicamba drift on corn and grain sorghum. Is there any, any concerns or any any growth stage that a, a low rate of dicamba could or shouldn't cause any problems. All right, thanks, Jason. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we really haven't looked at, I guess, dicamba drift on the corn or grain sorghum as a function of yield reduction or injury, but we know that uh, dicamba is registered as a labeled product in both of those crops. And so, we can use dicamba uh, or, you know, safely as far as corn injury. Now, anybody that's uh, planning on using dicamba in corn next year or this season needs to check with the Arkansas State Plant Board regulations because we have cutoff dates for uh, specific dicamba products. And actually, I was looking at the new labels for uh, Extendamax and Ingenia, and based on the new uh, registration for those two products. I'm not sure that they're going to have a label in crops that are not extend. And so we're 
still trying to sort some of those out. So to answer that, I'm not really sure what we're going to have labeled from a dicamba standpoint in corn or grain sorghum. But, uh, you know, from a drift standpoint, I don't think we're going to see much, if any, injury from those to, from dicamba. Okay. Another question, and, and you, you drive around the state, especially South Arkansas, you know, March, you know, we're planting corn and you see, you see ryegrass all over the, the bottom ends of fields. And a lot of times it's all the way across the field. So, you know, if producer waits till two weeks ahead of planting or two or three weeks ahead of planting and you got ryegrass, and you're going into corn, what, 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 what kind of options do we really have at that point? Well, if you're if you're leaving it to your planting corn, I think I think we're losing yield already. <laughs> so I I would uh, right now, if you've got a ryegrass problem, we need to be talking about things things to do. Now, when temperatures are below freezing, there's really not a whole lot we can do with it. Uh, we're in a period of winter now where we may not see many days, even in the highs of 50 or you know the upper 50s or something like that. So uh, it's better to control any weed when uh, they have some growth going on. I'd like to see temperatures get up into the 50s at a minimum before we spray a lot of fields probably, but I would get it on my mind. And uh, from a control standpoint, we're looking at herbicides like Select, Select Max. Uh, there's several generic formulations of that. So you got to know which one you're spraying. Uh, but a Select Max equivalent rate of 16 ounces uh, plus plus or minus Roundup. If, if you need Roundup in the tank, that's fine. But uh, I, if it's a bad ryegrass problem, I would not tank mix a lot of things with select because it's hard for select to control this ryegrass under these cool conditions anyway. And so uh, I, you know, in a bad situation, I'd probably run the select by itself uh, with the surfactant or crop oil, depending on the formulation that you have, and then come back uh, with another application for the, the rest of the broad leaves. Uh, Germoxone plus a PS2 inhibitor is another uh, option that we have to control ryegrass and, and uh, it's one of those things where you know we may need two applications regardless of which product we choose but if we spray germoxone on it I definitely like a photosynthetic inhibitor like a pinaatrazine in with that to help it translocate and kill. The other one that I mentioned in, um, in the presentation was lead off and lead off has rim sulfuron in it. And uh, we've had some success using uh, rim sulfuron in the past uh, to control certain populations of ryegrass. Now, if it's ALS resistant, we're, we're not gonna be too happy with that application. So you kind of have to know what you're dealing with on your farm, but, but uh, I have had some success with rim sulfuron and Nico sulfuron controlling it uh, after the corn is up, Jason, if we, if we don't get it all controlled early. But uh, by the time we get around to working ground, a lot of times this ryegrass has a root mass that's so large, we can't get rid of it just through tillage alone. So it's something we need to do pretty soon, get it on our mind. Yep. All right, Tom, what uh, an atrazine question. So what's the total in season amount of atrazine we can apply and, and how much would you suggest up front versus your, your, how would you split it out, I guess? Total amount in season and how, how you would split the atrazine out. Right, so the total amount is uh, two and a half pounds or it's uh, two and a half quarts, if you wanna remember it that way. Uh, I think there's no reason that we shouldn't use all of it on every acre of corn. But, uh, you know, if I use it up front, you know, in, in a two pass system, you know, I'd put it out probably at a quart that'd leave me a quart and a half later uh, to use. And some of these premixes I mentioned earlier, some of them may have atrazine with them. So you just kind of have to know what you're dealing with, but. We're, we're allowed a max of uh, two and a half quarts per year on atrazine. Okay. I got a question texted to me here. So enlist corn from a weed control program, what does that bring to us, if, if anything? Well, that's a good question. And, and I actually got to look at enlist corn for the first time this past season. And so, you know, when we use, so enlist is, providing tolerance to uh, 2,4-D, which corn is already fairly tolerant to that. It also is providing uh, tolerance to germinicides in the FOP chemistry. So Quisalifop uh, is an example there. Uh, you know, what that brings is a great question. If, if we have 
let's just say, for example, maybe a Johnson grass problem that we're losing control with Roundup. Uh, when we may be able to use uh, a FOP in that scenario to help us control that Johnson grass. For most of our corn acres, I don't know that it's gonna add a lot of benefit uh, to current herbicide tolerances that we're, we're growing in the state. Okay. We got uh, probably one, one more question here, and uh, and I've gotten the question every now and then. Popcorn. What uh, what what would be a good weed control program for popcorn? And and I guess would that would that be uh, the same program you would use in conventional corn? Right. I I think it is, and I get popcorn questions every year, Jason, and I every year I have to look it up because I can't remember what I was labeled in popcorn, but. Uh, for sure, atrazine and dual, I think, is is available there. Something, come, you know, don't hold me to this. Double check your labels. This is my, uh, you know, statement to keep me out of trouble. But I think that uh, some of the Callisto products or mesotrion products may be labeled in popcorn as well. And so just double check that before, before you apply those. Um, and uh, that way you don't mess up and blame me. <laughs> okay, Tom, I, I got one more question that come in here. Uh, you know, you talk about glyphosate resistant Johnson grass, and of course, you know, most of us are growing glyphosate resistant corn. So it seems like every year you see fields that has, has Johnson grass at the end of the season, you wonder was it, was it, uh, what, what happened there? So if you've got some, a lot of Johnson grass in some fields, what, would, what kind of a herbicide program would you suggest for that situation? Well, you know, if it's resistant to Roundup, it may also be likely resistant to ALS chemistry. And um, really in a Roundup ready corn scenario, that's about the only thing that we could add. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, but you know, your accent cue or steadfast cue would be good ones to, to try if you don't think you have ALS resistance. Um, Well, I just lost my train of thought, but I, I had one other thought there. But, uh, you know, there's just not a lot of answer for us in Johnson grass if we can't control it with Roundup. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Tom, appreciate the uh, question and answer session. And I think we'll go, on, go ahead and go on to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Terry Spurlock. He's an associate professor and extension plant pathologist. And he's going to share some information about corn disease management. So, so my name is Dr. Terry Spurlock and I'm an extension and research plant pathologist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service. And today it's my pleasure to present the corn pathology update for the 2021 winter production meeting series. So 2020 was a pretty typical year for foliar disease in corn with the exception of southern rust. I think we saw more rust in 2020 than we've seen since uh, 2017. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there's a typical year uh, in Arkansas row crop production, but uh, I think I think for the most part, we saw what we expected to see, especially given uh, the information that we were getting early in the season and, and seeing the, uh, the amount of rainfall that we had, uh, delaying planting of corn in a lot of fields uh, that ended up causing us some issues later on in the season. One of the issues though that, that I've seen for a number of years now, and I wanna talk about a little bit is this stunning and, and uh, this slow, uh, much less vigorous off-color corn. Uh, you know, this is from a field in Deshea County, but, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm called out to these fields, um, they're, they're uh, sandy. Maybe they've had some uh, root knot nematode issues in cotton or soybeans in the past. Um, testing indicated there might be some, some corn pathogenic nematodes there like stubby root, uh, but, but sometimes not. Sometimes um, there's discussion about starter fertilizer maybe not being used, or it's just obvious that this stunning is happening in, in areas holding water, heavier ground, maybe a low spot, maybe the bottom of the field. Maybe nothing's obvious except the fact that 
there's these areas that are just not growing off very well. And, and so we have a problem there and, and we've seen it enough that a group of us have put together a project. So we're hoping to do some meaningful research in this area in addition to the nematode research that Dr. Fosky's lab is currently doing uh, in, in some, some corn fields that are known to have uh, a nematode issue. But uh, I, think, I think this is an issue for a number of reasons. One, it's an issue because it's probably robbing us of significant yield early in the season. And so we're sort of starting off uh, behind the eight ball a little bit in these fields from a yield loss perspective. And, you know, these plants just never seem to catch up. And so when we're trying to manage foliar diseases based on a growth stage and, and make a decision on maybe a fungicide application for southern rust later in the season, we have these uneven growth stages because the corn plant started slow and, and just never caught up to the rest of the field, fields tasseling at different times and things like that. So, so, so this is a season long problem that I think we need to get a better handle on moving forward. There's just a little too much of that out there right now. Other foliar diseases though, uh, what we normally see, northern corn leaf blight, there was a little bit of that, but I wouldn't say I, I saw any problematic fields. Southern corn leaf blight, a little bit of gray leaf spot, uh, maybe some curvularia leaf spot on susceptible hybrids, uh, but for the most part, um, the foliar diseases of concern this last year were, were southern rust and then common rust, uh, unfortunately mistaken uh, for southern rust in some instances, are just generating a great deal of concern. Uh, moving up the canopy when we were a little bit cooler and seeing some rainfall, maybe seeing a little uh, a little above average rainfall in some locations. And, and you know, that's common rust can move high up in the canopy in cooler wet conditions. There's no doubt about that. Early in the season, common rust doesn't necessarily look like it looks in this picture. This is about a perfect example of the two differences, different uh, fungi and their pustule colors. So common rust is a dark red brick brown, um, sort of pustule on both sides of the leaf most often. Um, and sometimes common rust will have this, I think a lot of times actually, southern uh, common rust will have this orangey yellow halo around it. This is on the underside of the leaf, uh, but certainly you can see that on the top and bottom. And southern rust will have a brighter yellow halo around those pustules a lot of times. If, if it's there, it's not always there, as you can see in this image, but that you know, just relying on the color can be tough early in the season, especially low in the canopy where light is a little bit, uh, or the light infiltration is a little bit less and they, they just don't darken uh, like they do late in the season. But what normally happens is, is the common rust will stay active low in the canopy, like on this lower leaf here and beat those lower leaves up pretty good. And uh, those lower leaves really aren't doing much as we advance in the season and we start getting close to tassel because the canopy's thickening up and there's just not much sunlight getting down there. So there's not a lot of photosynthesis going on in these lower leaves anyway. They're just sort of hanging on and, and not, not helping us a whole lot. So it's not a huge deal that they're getting beat up down there, but uh, absolutely they can serve as an inoculum source if the weather is conducive to disease development. Spores can move upwards and, and cause some disease uh, higher up in the canopy. But, but I get calls concerned about leaves that look like this that are down low in the canopy and I'm not that concerned. I get calls where common rust is moving in the canopy up high and I'm still not that concerned because it would be very unusual, almost unheard of for us to have to spray a fungicide on common rust or common rust called yield loss in the state of Arkansas. And so what happens is when the weather turns warmer, the common rust starts shutting down. And when southern rust arrives around the 1st of July, then the southern rust starts building if, we're, if we have some ample moisture and, and enough inoculum blowing in uh, from epidemics to our south in Louisiana and Texas and, and Mississippi. And so as I mentioned, it was a southern rust year. Uh, we found it in early July, um, just right there south of Pine Bluff. Seems like that's where we find it every year. Uh, don't find it in Chico County first. Don't find it in Ashley County first. Seems to skip over to Shea County and just started right there around 
Pine Bluff and Eastern Jefferson County, uh, Eastern Lincoln County every year. I don't know why that's just the way it is. Uh, I don't have a good explanation for that. But one thing that was unusual, I don't know how unusual it is, but what was unusual is that Southern rust spread all the way up into um, Minnesota and South Dakota and was uh, knocking on the door at Michigan by the end of the year and uh, was, was prevalent all the way through the Mid-South. Um, and so we did some pretty hard scouting, uh, especially of late planted corn. And, and based on the scouting, what we decided was that uh, about April 20th was the cutoff for corn that probably needed to be sprayed if there was a population of southern rust in that field. And so um, we, had, uh, we had a few too many fields that looked like this, a lot of southern rust and silks not turning brown yet. So uh, normally what we say is that 5% southern rust on the ear leaf at R4 could be about five bushels of yield loss. Well, certainly, uh, if greater than 5% southern rust on the ear leaf throughout the field at R3 or earlier is, is cause for real concern. And a field can suffer substantial yield losses uh, if, not, uh, if not handled timely with a fungicide application. And, and so, again, we saw too much of this. Saw a lot of this in corn planted April 20 to uh, right around May 1 and, and had, to, had to spray more fields than, than I've had to spray uh, that I can remember. So at least in fields that I was involved with. And, and again, that non-uniform growth stage in some of these fields saw a lot of that with the late planted corn uh, too. I think that caused some, some concern and, and, and made it a little more difficult to manage uh, in some areas. But uh, when we have a lot of southern rust, we have a lot of foliar disease, uh, that makes for good fungicide trials. And so we had some good ones this year. And so I'm going to talk about some trial work this year and, uh, and one trial from the past uh, that kind of speaks to timing of fungicide application as well as, as reinforces some, some epidemiology work that we've been doing in my lab. We just finished a four-year study, uh, had a grad student. Uh, work on it for two or three years and then had uh, we finished up a couple of years after the student graduated just understanding how southern rust moves in a field that epidemiology within the field and what we found was that in that study southern rust seemed to build preferentially in these areas that were healthier just uh, whether it be a higher NDVI value indicating a higher rate of photosynthesis or or, or more leaf surface area, denser canopy, maybe that rust was protected. And so some of these trials that we did this year, while not necessarily, uh, we, weren't, we didn't necessarily have that objective uh, to look at the Southern rust relationship to plant health or, or that, that sort of epidemiological movement of, of the pathogen in a whole field, we saw some indications where that was validated through some of these fungicide trials in addition to some fungicide efficacy. Uh, so here's a trial. We had a planting rate by fungicide trial at Roar. Um, and we had quite a bit of southern rust in the trial. Planted the first week of May, so certainly not the latest trial that we planted all year. Um, but uh, here we had three different planting rates and we saw from a yield perspective, yields were flat in the higher two plant rates, 35,000 and 45,000. We saw that lower yield in 25,000, under 30,000, we would expect to see a yield drop off. And that, that corn, those plots didn't look very good. They were spindly, they were thin. But uh, what was interesting was, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't really see a great deal of control I'm in those plots. I'm, this is variability, but there wasn't much difference there, and that was strange. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what went on there, but what I did see was we had more southern rust uh, in the untreated in that higher population. And we did a good job controlling it with Triva Pro at 13.7 ounces, uh, and the same in the 35,000 there too. And it's worth pointing out just an example of those plots after application. And, and Tribal Pro is an excellent material on Southern Rust. It's, uh, in my mind, it's absolutely the best. We've seen it for a number of years and, and it always has looked good. 
uh, when we've when we've timed it correctly. It's always looked good and done a good job cleaning up the rust. And so top to bottom, these plots are pretty clean. There's the untreated, no yield difference. But again, this planted first of May and uh, not the highest yield in corn test that we had. So um, you know, I think that maybe contributed that to contributed to that as well. But but certainly a big difference between the Triva Pro application and the untreated. Another trial that we had a time and trial in the same field planted a week to 10 days later, uh, where we had Veltema and some other fungicides um, that we, we initially tried to apply at R1, R3. And, and uh, because of rain and some other, some other things, we didn't get them out till R3 and R4. Uh, and so, these data showed us something that was pretty interesting, even having that little hiccup there. Uh, we had the, and we, we met, I should mention now that we, we rate the corn canopy in three sections, below the ear leaf, a section kind of at the ear leaf, and then above the ear leaf. And so we like to chop that corn canopy up in those sections so we can, uh, we can get an idea of the spread upwards uh, through the canopy of, of southern rust. And so, here we've got untreated above the ear leaf and below the ear leaf. And these were these these both these untreated had significantly more southern rust above the ear and at the ear leaf uh, than Veltima at seven ounces at R3. And R4, that wasn't necessarily different. So so that was interesting, but there's certainly a numerical difference. Well, when we look at the plots, what was interesting about this was at R3, the Veltima did a really good job cleaning up southern rust. I mean, those plots are pretty clean there. Um, and I'm, I'm happy with that. But at R4, see, this was later planted corn. And that southern rust had already moved in and was already attacking the ear leaves. And by just waiting that, that short amount of time there, um, those ear leaves were smoked. And so we did a pretty good job controlling it in the top of the canopy, if you can see that. Um, and that's reflected here. Um, there's there's certainly more at the ear leaf than there was uh, above the ear, and there's still some southern rust up there. But these ear leaves and right around the ear leaves are smoked. And so this speaks to just you know a good product that was sprayed at the wrong time and didn't necessarily do a great job there in that particular trial. So even though we were at R4, the southern rust had moved in early enough that that was too late. Uh, a trial in 2017, I think, is is relevant for for this talk today. And I think 2017, I mentioned earlier, was uh, was a, a year a lot like 2020 with respect to the amount of southern rust that we had. And so it's worth mentioning now again our threshold, which I think is a pretty good threshold at R4 uh, and 5% southern rust on the ear leaf would result in about five bushels of yield loss. Uh, if if left untreated. Now, certainly at R4, if there's not any southern rust, there's no need to spray a fungicide and the southern rust moving in later probably wouldn't do much damage. And that's kind of reflected up here from some of our spatial modeling data and whole field epidemiology work that we've done. Uh, we've seen it at about R5 and a half that it takes about 25% southern rust on the ear leaf to cause two bushels of yield loss. And so that's that's not enough yield loss 10 days after dent to, uh, to worry so much about, uh, about applying a fungicide and being able to, to get a good return on investment on that particular application. But in this trial, we had common rust and southern rust at R4, right on R4, and we had kind of a fungicide shootout with a lot of different products here uh, and had a, a bunch of V6 applications and a bunch of R1 applications. Now, in this particular trial, late in the season, we had an anthracnose event on top of the rust. And so that created quite a bit of damage in this trial. But what's interesting about this is the way the yields shook out later. And all those V6 applications, whoops, all those V6 applications are down here around the untreated check, whereas all the R1 applications are up here where the yield's a little bit higher. Now, we're still not, this isn't a high yield in test by any means, but it, it kind of took a beating with the rust and the anthracnose and some wind damage and whatnot. But uh, if you just look, um, if you just look at these R1s, I think they were probably a little bit early too. Um, 
but uh, the V6 was really early. And I don't, I don't mean to suggest that there's a lot of V6 applications in the state of Arkansas going out on corn or even V10. But what I do want to highlight is that not only is too late a problem when we're, when we're trying to manage southern rust, say too late with a fungicide application, but too early can be problematic as well. And, and actually, by the time that fungicide plays out, uh, you're not going to get any sort of residual control of a foliar disease that's developing even, even really late in the season, certainly. So important to, to keep in mind. This is a study that I'm working with uh, Dr. Chris Henry's laboratory, um, where Chris, uh, it's, it's funded by the Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Promotion Board. Chris is working on improving irrigation scheduling and efficiency. And we had two trials with Chris in this, uh, on this particular project at, uh, at Roar Station and, and Rice Research and Extension Center, where uh, there was scheduled irrigation every seven days and then sensor-based irrigation. And, um, and so we added a fungicide treatment uh, with the schedule and the sensor. And at the ROAR trial, we didn't really see a ton of difference in southern rust. There was, there was, a, there was less southern rust where we had sprayed a fungicide, but not a lot less. And, and this trial was planted a little bit late, but not, not as late as some of my other fungicide work on the station, certainly a few weeks before that. And some differences down here in the severity, the red bars would be severity and the blue bars would be incidence of southern rust, uh, which uh, I should explain incidence is the, uh, the number of plants with southern rust uh, in an area that we're evaluating or in a plot if we're evaluating a small plot. And the severity is the amount on the plants that have southern rust. So that's how, that's what we term incidence and severity in these, in, in these trials. Um, but what is noteworthy in this trial is the yields weren't significantly different, but where we had um, the, the irrigation scheduled every seven days, there was a numerical difference in yield by about five bushels uh, between the fungicide applied and, and the non-fungicide applied. But in the sensor-based irrigation, those yields were absolutely flat and actually numerically a couple bushels higher where we didn't apply a fungicide. Now, again, this is all variability and not significant, but some indication that maybe pushing that, pushing that, that corn with, uh, with uh, irrigation every seven days and also getting some timely rains influenced that southern rust activity in those particular plots. Um, in, uh, in, the, in the study at Rice Research and Extension Center, without a doubt where the irrigation was scheduled every seven days, we had significantly more southern rust uh, when compared to sensor-based irrigation and, and certainly numerically much less. Um, in this group, sensor and schedule with, with fungicide applications, but all were significantly less than the schedule, the irrigation scheduled plots with no fungicide. So uh, an interesting study where, again, we see that maybe by, by our irrigation, uh, our irrigation schedule, uh, how much water we're actually moving uh, through, the, through the middles there and influence in that, maybe that canopy density and, 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 and growth were, uh, were influencing the southern rust epidemic to some degree. And then another study that we're working on implementing cover crops into corn rotation and its impact on soil health, another, uh, another uh, project funded by the Arkansas Corn and Grain Soil Promotion Board with Dr. Trent Roberts Laboratory. Uh, I have a part of this project, Travis Foskey has a part of this project, and Alejandro Rojas, uh, our soil-borne plant pathologist in Fayetteville is also working on this project. But this is a test, uh, I think this was a, this is a long-term rotation study at Pine Tree, and so, uh, the blue outline plots are the corn plots, and these are soybean plots. And each one of these blocks actually had a different cover crop or, or I think fallow ground. And so what we did in, in for the project to soil sample and try to understand aspects of soil health change in between the cover crops and whatnot in the corn is we picked two points within each block. And one point was called the unhealthiest 
and it was not necessarily the unhealthiest, but an unhealthy point, and the other one was more healthy. And so we used an NDVI, which is behind these plots. You can see it here where green is more healthy and red is less healthy. Yellow is in the middle in the corn plots, and we actually used that as well as visual observation to mark these points. And so my part of this project was to after, after I designated the points was to rate the foliar disease. And so in a rust year, obviously it was Southern rust that we rated. And what we saw was fairly interesting. We saw that in the healthy group, uh, there was a lot more Southern rust and this is incidence and severity again, but there was a lot more Southern rust in the healthy group uh, than in the unhealthy group of points. And no difference among cover crop treatments, and we wouldn't expect that because southern rust blows in. It's not in the field, and so uh, we wouldn't expect cover crop to necessarily have a direct effect on the amount of southern rust that we're seeing in a field, maybe, maybe indirectly on some level, possibly, but in this particular instance, certainly not a direct effect. But uh, the, the healthy corn plants versus the unhealthy and why this field had so much variability, I don't know. It wouldn't be good if it was your field, but for our purposes in this test, we actually had a lot of within field variability in the plots. And so in some of these plots, it was really easy to pick out a group of healthy corn plants and a group of not so healthy and spindly looking uh, kind of ugly corn plants. So uh, we had big difference in southern rust activity between the two. And I think this study, even though one year's data and the, the irrigation study, um, when we look at that with some of our other work that we've done in the past, you know, it's, it's an indication that we just get more Southern rust in better corn. And, and I think that's important to, to understand when we're considering a fungicide application. So we talked a little bit about timing too um, and, and we're, we're pretty clear that, uh, that R4 is kind of iffy, um, where if, if Southern rust is starting at R4, it would have to be in that 5% range uh, to, to start thinking about, start thinking about a fungicide application paying for itself or keeping enough yield to justify the application. But, but I think certainly like 2020, uh, years like 2020, when there's there's more southern rust than that, earlier than R4, uh, as even even earlier, maybe, or right at the front end of R3 in some of these really late planted fields, that's a cause for concern, and and uh, folks should really consider a fungicide application in those scenarios. So, the highest likelihood of return on investment when we're talking about fungicides for southern rust, or, or you know. Remember this, all the hybrids we grow are susceptible, every single one. Uh, so we don't have any resistance out there. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna combat it that way. Um, late planted fields, late April, early May certainly. Uh, used to, I think that cut off and, and traditionally that cut off has been about May 1, uh, where we've talked about, hey, May 1, that's, that's really a field to watch out for Southern rust. But this year it was a little earlier based on growth stage. And so we called it April 20. And that's, that's gonna move from year to year based on the environment and where we're at in that corn crop and where Southern rust is uh, in its progression from the South. Um, in other, for other diseases, foliar diseases, uh, we would discuss like a farm history of disease or a field history of disease, but that's not really relevant for southern rust. It doesn't overwinter here, so, so, so that's not a consideration. But we do have that area that, again, I don't know why, but every year it seems South Pine Bluff, that's the first place we see southern rust, or eastern Lincoln County, that's the first place that we see southern rust develop. So certainly if you're in that area and you have late planted corn, uh, you know, that's July, the second, third week of July is a good, a good time to scout for Southern rust because that's probably where it's going to show up first in the state. Um, it's worth mentioning, uh, adequate water volume from an application. Um, there has to be enough water, uh, to move that product down to the ear leaf. So if enough product doesn't get to the ear leaf and there's a lot of activity there, or there's some activity, modern activity of southern rust on the ear leaf starting up, and then we don't move enough product there, your plots are going to look like the ones I showed earlier, where the top of the plant's green, but right around the ear leaf, 
those leaves are smoked and that's not a good scenario. So need to move enough product. If we're gonna, if we're gonna apply a fungicide, need to move enough product down there to get good control. Uh, we've talked about timing R3 and before there certainly uh, in 2020 was, was prevalent and, and those fields uh, needed a fungicide application and then the yield potential. And I think what we've seen from the research in my lab and highlighted just a little bit in this talk too, is that corn with the highest yield potential has, has uh, I think the greatest opportunity for Southern rust to build. And so it's obviously that's the fields you'd like to spend more money on uh, as well, or at least you have the opportunity to put a little more money into with fungicide application because you expect to get more out. I mean, that's just good common sense. But um, I think one of the things we expect is we expect that uh, a plant that's healthier should be able to defend itself from uh, other foliar diseases and the stresses of, of the environment. And that's absolutely true. But there's, I don't think there's this relationship of this linear relationship based on the data of more disease equals more yield loss. It really doesn't work that way. It's about the timing of the disease. And it's also, there's environmental factors within the field that control how that disease spreads and moves throughout that field. So, you know, the only way to understand what the disease is doing in the field is to get out there and scout. And, and I think, um, a, a very straightforward statement is this to sum it up is that you get more southern rust and better corn, period. And with that, I'd like to recognize the extension plant pathology group that works with corn. Myself and Travis, our contact information is there. Uh, Sherry Smith and Katie Moore Wiki in the Plant Health Clinic in Fayetteville certainly have, have are, the, are available to diagnose corn diseases. Uh, should you send samples their way. Amanda Greer, who is the diagnostician uh, in the Arkansas Nematode Diagnostic Laboratory in Hope. I want to thank the Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Promotion Board for supporting this research I've talked about today and other research in my lab and, and other laboratories and help, helping us to uh, advance disease management in the Mid-South and state of Arkansas. And then lastly, but certainly not least, uh, recognize some county agents in South Arkansas that have helped me this year and, and in the past track down Southern Rust. Stephen Stone in Lincoln County, uh, Clay in Chico County, and Kevin in Ashley County, and Kurt Beatty in Jefferson County. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Spurlock. Uh, again, if, if you have questions, go ahead and enter them in the Q&A box and we'll, we'll get to them. We've got a, Terry, we've got a couple questions here we can start in on. Um, what about Diplodia leaf streak? I mean, I, I see that every now and then, um, sometimes misidentified, kind of looks like Northern corn leaf blight. Is that something we need to be concerned about or, or is it more like a common rust where we can see it, but not really all that worried about it? Uh, good question. I, I get a lot of calls about that. And, and I think one of the reasons why it's noticed is because the lesions get so large. Uh, sometimes it looks like a large northern corn leaf blight lesion. Other times it's the lesion is, is stretching halfway across the leaf. And so uh, I, think, I think it could be a cause for concern if there was a lot of it, if you scouted the cornfield at multiple points and you saw it, but we haven't seen any reason uh, to spray for that yet. We, we haven't seen enough of it in a field that, uh, that scares us to the point that we think we're losing yield. So I, so I would say treat it more like common rust right now and, and we'll keep scouting and trying to understand its impact. Okay, the, the other question is on grain sorghum. So in, any new data on fungicide benefits in grain sorghum? And you know, if you were gonna put out a fungicide on grain sorghum, what, what uh, mode of action or what, what fungicide family would you use? Yeah, so, the, so historically, uh, the best product we've seen on, on anthracnose, uh, as well as target spot, which is that uh, purple, that purple lesion we see on, on grain sorghum, if you've ever grown 9782, you know, those, 
those fields can be just uh, purple by the end of the year. Um, that Preaxor has just done a wonderful job. Four ounces of Preaxor always uh, has done a wonderful job on, on both anthracnose and target spot. And, and so, you know, that's a mixed mode action product. And, and I don't think, I don't think the timing though is, is something that's, that's necessarily easy uh, because it's really about when the disease comes in. And so if, if you're, if you're timing it like an automatic application, even on some, on something like 9782 that gets a ton of target spot, uh, I don't, I don't know that that application always pays for itself if that target spot doesn't get going. Uh, until you know that field's flowered and, and and maybe even a little later when it starts uh, really turning purple out there so so certainly prior to heading or at heading there's there's much more of an opportunity for a return on investment with with a product uh, applied then and and certainly an opportunity for yield loss i think you know we don't grow many anthracnose susceptible hybrids these days but if we do and you get it and you don't spray it, it can be a, a significant loss to you in that field and, and certainly needs to be treated promptly. Terry, I've got a question that's texting me here. So, you know, a lot of our corn is sprayed with a fun foliar fungicide, you know, prob a lot of times preventatively. So even in those fields where you put out a foliar fungicide, say at tassel or R1 or R2, you have stock rot, stock lodging late in the season. So what, what, what can we do about those type problems, stock lodging, stock rots, and are any of our foliar fungicides you discussed that are more for Southern rust, are, are they gonna have any impact? So we We've got a we've got an efficacy table in MP154. I want to point everybody to. If if you feel like you need to spray a fungicide, go there and look at the efficacy ratings from the regional data to help you get a better handle on on what should be applied. Let's say, you know, with if you applied a preventative fungicide uh, to try to prevent stalk rot early in the year, I still don't think that uh, I don't think the residual. Uh, even past 21 days is going to give you enough uh, when the data that you've shown, Jason, and some of your work seems to be related uh, back, to, back to hybrid susceptibility to, to salt, stalk strength and, and lodging. Um, so, so I don't like fungicides applied early in the season to prevent lodging late in the season. Uh, a foliar disease like southern rust if it was left untreated and it happened, it occurred early enough, like say this year you had a field that maybe you didn't want to spend any money on and that Southern rush just got out there and, and went crazy and turned the field orange. You know, in theory, um, if it occurred early enough and, and those corn plants hadn't filled out their ears yet, then there's some, there's some nutritional robbing that could occur from the stalk and weaken the stalk and cause that corn plant to be more susceptible to lodging. But, but that's relatively uncommon for us. Most of the time we're gonna outrun the foliar diseases like Southern rust in our corn crop. And so again, a fungicide to control that makes sense. A fungicide to control stock rot early in the season doesn't make much sense. It's really about going back and look at the hybrid data, looking at the hybrid data to understand which ones might have a standability issue versus those that do not. Okay, and uh, we, we've got one other question here. Uh, well, we've got a couple actually just popped up here. So let's, uh, let's answer this one live. Aflatoxin, uh, you know, that's something that we, historically we, we, has been a big deal. Fortunately for us, the last three to five years have not had a lot of problems with them, maybe isolated areas, but overall not that big of a, a problem. So what about Aflagard for, to help control or suppress aflatoxin development? Is that something that we would recommend Aflagard in corn? Not on irrigated corn. We just, we just don't have the data to suggest that aflatoxin and, and, and the fungus that causes it, that causes that, that ear rot, uh, aspergillus, that sort of army green fuzzy uh, looking fungus you can see on the corn here. You know, we just don't have uh, much evidence to suggest that that's a problem for us on irrigated corn. And, 
and our I think our issue in Arkansas is is maybe over irrigation rather than than corn that's suffering from drought stress. So uh, so I really don't think that that aflatoxin uh, is is much of an issue. And so I, I think that kind of answers the question on on Afligard as well. Okay, Terry, we've got one more question here and then we'll move on to the next presentation. But uh, audience asked in your first photo, which I'd have to go back and look, you talked about, we were talking about young plants here. What was the possible pathology issue that you were talking about there? So in that particular field, we don't know. Um, that, that field had a number of issues. There was kind of, it was kind of everything except the starter fertilizer that I mentioned. So it, you know, there was rotten roots. Uh, it was planted early, so it was planted into cool, wet soil. Um, that field had a history of, of severe southern root knot nematodes, so I don't, I didn't, I don't think there was an issue with some nematode feeding there, but I do think when we plant into cool, wet soil, you know, the opportunity for pythium species, rhizoctonias, there's just a host of these pathogens that can cause disease on, on uh, young corn plants and, and do a little bit of damage, especially when you see that, that sort of patchy distribution there. But uh, that's, you know, there could have been multiple issues there. We did some isolations and grew multiple pathogens out of those corn plants, but there really wasn't anything we could put our finger on that said this was it. So that's one of the reasons why we're interested in doing some more research. We need some data on this. Okay, well, thank you, Terry. We appreciate your, your answers there. And so now we're gonna move on to our next presenter, Dr. Trent Roberts. He's gonna to talk to us about corn nutrient management. And uh, anytime during his presentation, go ahead and enter your questions in that Q&A. You don't have to wait till the end. Hello, my name is Trent Roberts and I'm a soil fertility extension specialist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. And today for the corn webinar, I will be discussing corn nutrient management. So to start with the topical outline, we'll be covering the nutrients that are primary limiting in Arkansas corn production. We'll talk about a little bit of the importance of nutrient budgeting nitrogen and zinc management, and then the value of poultry litter. So to start off, I'm not gonna be covering corn agronomics, but I think we really need to talk about two distinctly different production scenarios. When we look at you know, areas or production systems that have less than 180 bushels per acre, I think the focus in those systems really needs to be increasing our yield. So what's limiting your corn yield or your profitability? In these low production scenarios, we need to, to identify those limiting factors, whether it be irrigation, you know, not enough or too much, agronomics such as hybrid selection, row spacing, plant population, and then obviously fertility can play a large role in that. But if you fall into that category where you're consistent, consistently producing less than 180 bushels per acre, you really need to identify those limiting factors and focus on how you can increase your corn grain yield. For those producers that fall into, you know, yield or a production system where they're making greater than 180 bushels per acre, then I think those producers really need to start focusing on profit. How do they maximize their profit? And when you start thinking about profitability in particular and how to maximize it, it is going to be tightly linked to your fertilization. Because whether we're talking about nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or any of the nutrients we're going to apply to the majority of our corn production systems, the profitability of that system is going to be tightly linked to making sure you get those rates correct that not only uh, maximize your yield, but also optimize your return on investment. So what are some of the common nutrient deficiencies in Arkansas corn production? For the vast majority of the acreage, nitrogen is going to be the most limiting nutrient that has to be applied in the greatest quantities to maximize yield. But the productivity as well as the profitability of your production system is going to be tightly linked to that nitrogen rate. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that we can manage nitrogen, but the more efficient we become, the better we fine tune those rates, then the more profitable we become. And that's something that we really need to focus on. 
uh, phosphorus can be limiting in a lot of our soils and it becomes limiting both in high and low pH uh, scenarios. So we need to keep that in mind. Uh, potassium is often limiting, especially on our uh, loamy textured soils or our sands. Uh, sulfur can be limiting in our low organic matter or sandy soils. Uh, zinc can be a problem, you know, both in high and low pH. So we need to focus on zinc management. And then over the past few years, we've been getting more calls specifically related to magnesium deficiency. And that's usually going to be confined to sandy low pH soil. So very small, small, small percentage of our uh, production area, but it is still a uh, problem that exists and we need to be aware of. So I think the first thing I want to hit on real quick is just fertilization, fertilization economics and productivity. And so when we think about a corn production system, you know, fertilization is just one piece of that puzzle that's going to impact, you know, our profitability and ultimately our return on investment. And so if you look at the 2021 crop enterprise budget, you know, depending on how you set the parameters, fertility or fertilization is going to cost for anywhere from 25 to 30% of the total production budget. And if you look, you know, within that recommendation, it's typically for 0, 80, 80. That's the baseline, you know, kind of default, um, zero pounds of nitrogen, 80 pounds of P2O5, 80 pounds of K2O. And if you look at that particular recommendation, assuming these prices, you know, that comes out to about $56.80 per acre. And, you know, I like to remind everyone that when you look at those crop enterprise budgets, those defaults that are in there, are for medium soil test P and medium soil test K levels. So the next slide, what I want to do is just kind of go through and have you think about how manipulating or changing those soil test levels or soil test categories influence the cost of fertilization. So if you look here in bold, we have the medium soil test P with a recommended rate of 80 units of P2O5 per acre. And we have our medium soil test K with 80 units of K2O per acre. And you can see this is the default in our crop enterprise budget. And so if you were to apply that 0, 80, 80, it would cost you around $56 per acre to do that. What we found, though, is that one of the most common recommendations that's actually uh, given out by the soil test lab in Mariana is very low soil test P and very low soil test K. So what that means is chances are you might fall into that low uh, soil test P, low soil test K category. And what that equates to is a significant increase in the cost of your phosphorus and potassium fertilization programs. So you can see we jump from 56 almost up to $80 per acre. But I think the point that I'm trying to emphasize here is that, you know, the profitability of your production system is going to be tightly linked to your fertility program. And rather than just relying on those default values in the crop enterprise budget, I think it's very important as a producer that you go in for your specific fields, your specific production scenarios, and actually, you know, determine, you know, what your soil test levels are, determine the associated rates, and actually put those into the crop enterprise budget so you can truly see how it's going to impact uh, the cost of your fertilization program. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and start talking about our nitrogen management flow chart. So hopefully you all have seen this. Uh, we've tried to present it at several different meetings just to get people more familiar with it. And basically what we've tried to do is just make it a simple step-by-step -step approach as to how we want you to think about your nitrogen management program and make those decisions, you know, from starting at the soil texture all the way through the end of the season. So when we start with soil texture, we typically split it into our lighter textured soils like our silt loams and our sands, and then our heavier, more clay textured soils. And that's gonna determine the season total end rate. And then from there, what we essentially want you to do is consider the number of splits that you wanna use, whether that's a two-way split or a three-way split. And we want you to consider, you know, 30 to 45 units of N per acre for a silt loam and 45 uh, to 60 units of N per acre on a clay. And really what we want you to do is reduce that pre-plant in rate as low as you can and still feel comfortable. The one thing that our research has consistently shown time and time again is that pre-plant nitrogen applications are the least efficient application time. And so even though they're important, even though they contribute to our uh, corn production system, 
they're very inefficient. And so anything that we can do to reduce those is going to have you know, a great impact, not only on the efficiency of our production system, but on our profitability as well. Uh, the next thing that I want to emphasize is, you know, collecting ear leaf or collecting leaf samples to determine whether or not our nitrogen program is sufficient in season. And I'll discuss that a little bit more, but anywhere from the V10 to the R1 growth stage, we can take samples um, of the uppermost collared leaf or the ear leaf once it's present and determine whether or not nitrogen is adequate to maximize yield and productivity. Uh, the magic number for that is 3%. So as long as we're above 3%, we know that nitrogen is optimal and we're not going to get any benefit from further nitrogen applications. If you know the concentration is less than 3%, then we need to consider applying anywhere from 45 to 60 units of N per acre to help increase that tissue concentration, you know, maintain it at a level where we can be ensured that nitrogen is not going to be limiting our corn grain yield. And then obviously at the end of the season, once we reach black layer, we can start to discuss things like the corn stock nitrate test, which is an end of season report card that allows us to determine how well we managed our nitrogen fertilization in season. So nitrogen management. There are a lot of different tools that we have available to help producers manage nitrogen in corn. The one that I really wanna focus on right now is this corn leaf tissue test that can be used really anytime between B10 and R1. When we're early in that vegetative growth, you know, from B10 to BT, we want you to sample that uppermost collared leaf. Uh, once the ear leaf is visible, then we want you to sample the ear leaf, which we consider that the leaf immediately subtending the ear. So in this first example, uh, what is the uppermost uh, collared leaf? This is what you're gonna sample between B10 to BT. You can see here in the diagram, the arrow indicates this uppermost collared leaf. Uh, we call it the uppermost fully collared leaf because you can see the entire collar on that particular leaf. What we would want you to do is essentially break off the leaf blade and we want the entire leaf blade from the collar to the tip included in the sample. As we get later in the season and we get to that VT to late R1 growth stage, you can typically identify the ear leaf. And so for our purposes, the ear leaf is the leaf that's immediately subtending the ear. You can see the ear here with the silks emerging. And we want the sampled leaf to be this one immediately below that particular ear leaf. And once again, we want you to break it off at that collar and send in the entire leaf blade. So when we think about what we're doing here, our critical concentration is 3% from V10 all the way through R1. And what we're talking about is total nitrogen concentration. And so this is gonna be different than nitrate or some of the other tests that you might've heard about. We typically do this analysis at the Arkansas Diagnostic Lab in Fayetteville, or there are many other uh, you know, private labs that can do it, including Waypoint and, and several others. But the analysis that you're gonna be interested in is total nitrogen. And once again, the number is 3% that we wanna maintain. If we keep our leaf tissue nitrogen concentration above 3%, we know that nitrogen is not limiting our corn production system and uh, we don't need additional nitrogen to maintain our yield. The next thing I wanna talk about real quick is the importance of zinc for corn uh, production. Our zinc recommendations are first based on soil pH and then soil test zinc concentration. We break it up into greater than and less than pH 6.0. You can see when we have higher pH soils of 6.0 or above, we recommend 10 pounds of actual zinc per acre all the way out through our medium soil test zinc category or uh, four parts per million. What that means, zinc tends to be less available at higher soil pHs. And so therefore we require a greater soil test concentration or we require higher uh, zinc fertilization rates in order to overcome that and ensure that there's enough available for the crop to take up and maximize yield and productivity. You can see at pH values less than 6.0, we only recommend zinc in that very low soil test category when we have less than 1.6 parts per million soil test zinc. Once again, that's due to the fact that zinc is more available at acidic or lower pHs, and so therefore we can get by with lower soil test categories and lower application rates. I think in a lot of situations, there's potential that we're losing corn grain yield to zinc deficiencies 
um, due to hidden hunger or potentially other problems. And it's because, you know, we can't or we don't feel comfortable pulling the trigger on that 10 pound of actual zinc per acre, you know, application cost. And what I will tell you is I think there's a lot of cases that we're probably losing anywhere from 10, 15, you know, 20 bushels of grain yield to zinc deficiency, and we don't see those typical visual deficiency symptoms of, of zinc that might alert us to that. So whether you're using, you know, grid soil sampling or field composite, I think it's very important that you identify that soil test zinc concentration and your pH to determine, you know, what level of zinc is needed to maximize that corn grain yield. So when we think about zinc management, there are really two ways that we can approach it. We can look at soil applied zinc and we can look at in season foliar applied zinc. Um, I am a huge proponent of 10 pounds of soil applied zinc. When you think about that particular approach, you know, typically we're going to be using granular zinc sulfate. It's going to require, you know, around 33 pounds of product per acre. Well, that is a very significant cost when you start thinking about $25 to $30 per acre just for zinc in that production system. One nice thing about zinc in particular is it's highly immobile in the soil. It's not going to go anywhere. So when we make these, um, you know, granular zinc applications to the soil, we're going to see increases in soil test zinc concentration over time. You know, some of the research that we have indicates that in as little as four applications, whether that's spread over, you know, back to back years or the cereal crops within a rotation, the typically four applications will raise your soil test zinc from the low to the optimum category. And what that means is that for as little as $100 per acre, you can basically move your soil test zinc concentration to a level where you no longer need to fertilize with zinc. Now, depending on your production scenario and your soil, you may not have to fertilize for five years, it may be 10 years, but it's gonna be a significant amount of time before that soil test zinc concentration drops back down and you have to add that zinc back into your fertility program. Now, what is the other approach? Well, the other approach is either as a rescue application or as an in-season application where we can do one pound of zinc foliar applied. All of our research indicates that you wanna use a chelated zinc source such as zinc EDTA. It's typically tank mixed and applied you know, via a spray solution. The problem with this particular approach is that it's gonna cost you relatively the same amount per acre, but it has little to no impact on your soil test zinc concentration. And so the really the problem that I have with foliar zinc applications are they're great if you need them, right? They're great as a rescue application if, if there's some kind of error and you're trying to make a correction. But if you're trying to actively or proactively manage your zinc, you should really think about doing soil applied zinc to build that soil test zinc level over time. Because when we rely on these foliar applications, they cost relatively the same amount. You're getting a 10th of the rate of zinc. It has little to no impact on your soil test zinc. And unfortunately, it's just a band-aid. It's something that you have to keep doing year after year uh, when you're growing corn or a cereal crop in that particular field. I want to shift gears and talk about my last topic real quick, which is chicken litter. You can see the slide here. You know, that chicken poop is probably worth a lot more than you think. Uh, what we've tried to do here is kind of break it down in the value of particular nutrients for different types of litter that's been lo locally sourced. So you can see here, you know, depending on where you're at in the delta, there's been a big influx of poultry production and there's a lot more poultry litter available for producers to purchase and utilize in their production systems. Over here on the left hand side, what we have are different litter analysis. Um, these are the means or the averages of different litter types that we've analyzed at the Agricultural Diagnostic Lab here in Fayetteville. You can see for broilers, we typically have a 61, 61, 55, and that's going to equate to you know, 61 pounds of nitrogen, 61 pounds of P2O5, and 55 pounds of K2O per ton. And then you can see the associated value of those different nutrients if we were to purchase them as commercial fertilizer, either as urea, triple superphosphate, or potash. And you can see the associated cost per ton for those commercial fertilizers and the cost per pound that I have assumed in these calculations. 
So if you just consider, you know, the phosphorus and the potassium value in poultry litter, you can see that depending on the source and the analysis, it can range anywhere from 33, you know, to $42 per ton in just the value of those two nutrients. If you consider, you know, a portion of the nitrogen available in that poultry litter, you know, for the crop that you're planting, then you can see that that value goes up, you know, quite a bit. Typically for our upland crops like corn, we assume that about 50% of that nitrogen is going to be available for the crop. So, you know, depending on how you count that nitrogen, it's only going to increase the value of your poultry litter. So now why am I emphasizing, you know, the value of poultry litter? I think in most cases, if we just consider the phosphorus and potassium value of poultry litter, we can have it purchased and spread or applied for a lower cost than what we what it would take to purchase that equivalent value of nutrients in commercial fertilizer. So what I'm saying is a lot of times you can get poultry litter, you know, purchased and spread cheaper than you could buy that same amount of nutrients in commercial or synthetic fertilizer. And then when you start to consider the other things like nitrogen or other nutrients or the organic matter that's added with poultry litter, then the value only goes up. And so I would encourage you, if you have access to poultry litter, you know, try to get um, analysis for the poultry litter, try to set down with this type of scenario and determine what its value is. And more often than not, you know, the value of that poultry litter is going to far exceed the cost that you're going to have to pay for it. And so take that into consideration and try to use it as often as you can. So some key takeaways. You know, please remember that corn yield and profitability is going to be tightly linked to our fertilization practices, especially profitability. When we're in those high production scenarios, you know, the difference between making, you know, 20 or $30 an acre and losing 20 or $30 an acre can be that nitrogen rate or that P and K rate that you use. So make sure you look at your soil test values, make sure you look at the cost of those, your, your crop production budget, and take all that into consideration. You know, remember that there are a lot of different ways to manage nitrogen in corn. You know, I hate to say this, but you can do almost everything wrong. And as long as you get, you know, at least 220 units out there and you do it in a halfway decent manner, you're probably still gonna cut a decent amount of yield. The problem is, is we need to increase our efficiency and we need to focus on profitability. And the two ways that we do that are emphasizing the timing of our application as well as the rates. Anything we can move from pre-plant to in season is going to increase efficiency, it's going to increase profitability. And remember that you know getting that pinpoint in terms of the nitrogen rate we need and when we need it applied is going to go a long way. Also remember those tools that we have available to use, especially such as the, the leaf or ear leaf nitrogen content. You know, zinc management is going to be critical for high yielding corn. I think there's a lot of hidden hunger out there that we need to start diagnosing and addressing. Um, lastly, you know, poultry litter is a great nutrient source. If you have access to it, always try to get an analysis and understand, you know, the nutrient content and then obviously the nutrient value associated with the poultry litter that you're purchasing. Lastly, I would just like to acknowledge the Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Promotion Board for their support. Pretty much everything I've discussed here today has been supported through their checkoff funding program. I'd also like to thank the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture, my soil fertility crew. I know we're going to have a question and answer session, but I just wanted to put up my email and uh, mobile phone number. If you guys ever have any questions about nutrient management in any of our Arkansas row crops, feel free to reach out and we'll do our best to answer those questions. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Dr. Roberts. And uh, we'll go ahead and start questions for Dr. Roberts. And I've uh, got three of them lined up here. Actually, I've got more than that. So we'll go ahead and jump in here. And if, if you do have more questions, uh, feel free to put, put your question in the Q&A box and we'll get to it uh, here momentarily. And so first question, how well do impregnated fertilizers such as zinc, such as a uh, mes or super zinc compare with zinc sulfate? So in other words, Dr. Roberts, so if we recommend 10 pounds of zinc and we a lot of times we use zinc sulfate as our source of zinc, 
What about if we use MEZ or some of these other combination products? Can we keep, do we need to keep the rate the same or can we cut the rate back? Thanks, Jason. Um, I will tell you, I've, I've got a fair amount of experience with the MEZ product. Uh, I do not have a lot of experience with the super zinc, uh, but they do follow the same type of, you know, similar approach where the zinc is blended into each fertilizer prill. And I think that, you know, one benefit that you do get with the zinc being impregnated in each prill is you get better distribution. And so at least a portion of the 10 pounds of actual zinc per acre rate that we recommend is to ensure that we do get adequate, you know, uniform distribution of zinc across the soil. Um, to go back to those impregnated uh, fertilizers in particular, I think one thing that you need to remember is they're not a primary zinc fertilizer source. And so typically they're gonna be a phosphorus fertilizer source. And that's what they really need to be approached as. And so when you're looking at something like MEZ, I think you want to apply MEZ to, you know, meet your P fertilizer rate, uh, which oftentimes may not give you an adequate level of zinc uh, to meet that 10 pound of actual zinc per acre level. And so what you need to do if you're using MEZ, which is a good product, is, you know, consider blending a little bit of zinc sulfate or something else uh, with it uh, to give you adequate zinc to overcome, you know, uh, a deficit of zinc either in the soil or, uh, you know, low soil test zinc or, or high pH issue. And so, you know, long story short, most of those blended fertilizers, you know, are P fertilizer sources, and that's really how they should be applied. And then you'll need to supplement with other zinc sources to ensure that you don't have a deficiency. Hey, Dr. Roberts, the other question is similar, but we're also asking a question about MEZ, but also what about a spire using a spire in corn? Okay, so a spire is another product by Mosaic. Uh, you know, Mos uh, when we look at a spire in particular, it's an impregnated fertilizer with the base source being uh, murate of potash with then boron added um, into that particular fertilizer. Uh, the majority of our research has shown no benefit from boron applications to corn in particular. And so uh, we would not recommend a spire uh, to be used in corn because really what you're looking for is that blend of both potassium fertilizer and boron, which would be great for our soybean production systems, uh, but would not necessarily be beneficial in our corn production systems. Okay, next question is growing corn on clay soil. So our, our nitrogen rates are typically higher on, on clay soil. So if we do have a, a productive field uh, and we feel like we have 220 plus bushel yield potential, how many total units of nitrogen would you recommend? And, and basically how, how would you spread that nitrogen out? Okay, if we're on a, a heavy productive clay soil, I think there are a couple of things that you want to consider. The first one is, you know, what is your irrigation or your water management on that field? Because I think when we get into those heavy clay soils, our bigger concern is how quickly we can get water on and off of those fields, because that's going to play a big role in how well we can manage our nitrogen fertilizer. The season total in rate for our clay soils was we want to shoot for somewhere around 290 total units of in. Uh, we talked about that pre-plant application timing being one of the least efficient, and that's going to definitely hold true on our clay soils, especially if they hold water uh, or we can't get water off of them quickly enough. And so typically on a clay soil, I want to go, you know, anywhere from 45 to 60 units pre-plant. I don't want to go much over 60 uh, just because, you know, some, some reasons we talked about earlier, we're going to be, you know, more prone to nitrogen losses, to denitrification and those types of things in those heavier clay soils. The flip side of that is if I do go, you know, low on my pre-plant, then I want to try to come in with another, you know, 45 to 60 units of nitrogen at that V2 to V3 growth stage 
kind of an early, you know, side dress or late post-emergence application. And then, you know, come back in with another, you know, 60 units or so uh, around that, you know, V6 to V8 growth stage. And then I think on those heavy clay soils, we can see some big benefits from, you know, going out with that pre-tassel. If we use our ear leaf nitrogen test to tell us whether or not we need additional late season nitrogen. I know heavy clay soils, it's always a challenge. So on nitrogen management is. So another nitrogen question, Trent, you talked about cutting back our, our pre-plant nitrogen. So in, in your mind on a typical sand or silt loam type soil, what, how much would be enough nitrogen, I guess, pre-plant? And then since you cut back up front, what, what would be the maximum amount of urea, most likely you would apply side dress at one time. Okay, well, if we're talking about lighter textured soils, such as our silt loams and sands, um, I think we can easily get by with 30 units of nitrogen pre-plant incorporated. Um, all of our research has shown that that's more than adequate uh, to get us to that V6 to V8 growth stage uh, where we can apply the, the bulk of our nitrogen. When you're talking about the max amount that you can apply, you know, in season as a side dress, from a nitrogen rate standpoint, you know, we routinely put out 200, 300 pounds of N at one time in our research without any problems. I think what you have to do as a producer, as a consultant is say, what can I get spread evenly and uniformly? And that really should be your maximum because depending on your application equipment, you know, we want to avoid streaking. We want to avoid, you know, those, those types of issues with those very high um, side dress rates. So really, I, I mean, I think we could go up to 100, 150 units, you know, plus of nitrogen. It's just whether or not we can get it spread uniformly. Um, to me, that's really the limit of the rates that we can put out at side dress is, is what we can put out uniformly. Okay, I've got uh, one more question and it relates to zinc. So, you know, in a lot of years, we, we plant corn stale seed bed. So it, ideally, you know, especially on heavier ground, a lot of people want to get the ground tilled up, rebedded and then just drop in and plant, you know, come March. So if I didn't put any zinc out last fall and bed it up and my field needs zinc on it, how effective is applying, surface applying zinc sulfate or mes or any type of granular zinc product? Uh, so when we start looking at granular zinc sources, you know, whether they're zinc sulfates or zinc oxides, you know, the two things that you need to consider are the solubility of the zinc source. And then, you know, zinc mobility is really going to be restricted in the soil unless it's a chelated zinc source. So typically our granular zinc sources, you know, we would consider them to be relatively immobile in the soil, uh, which means that surface applied zinc, uh, granular zinc sources, you know, typically they're not going to move down into the root system. And so what that means is a lot of times, you know, when those plants are going to be able to access and uptake that zinc is after we start irrigating and those corn roots actually kind of grow up towards the soil surface and they're accessing that, that surface layer of, of uh, soil where that zinc has fallen and been uh, attracted or attached to the, the soil colloids. And so long story short, zinc is pretty much immobile in the soil when it's um, added as a granular source. And, you know, really, if you've got to go out, um, you know, post-emergence or you've got to apply zinc, um, you know, to the soil surface without incorporation, uh, those are the, the types of situations where a foliar source might be, you know, a better option, especially if you're in a very low soil test zinc situation. Uh, but anytime we're doing foliar, I would encourage you to do a chelated zinc source because that chelated zinc source provides for both foliar uptake as well as soil uptake. Because when we apply a chelated zinc source, 
then that zinc becomes mobile in the soil. So it can actually move down into the root zone and be actively taken up by the corn plant. Okay, Trent, I've got one more question on zinc and then we'll uh, probably stop the questions for, for on the fertility section. Super zinc allows you to put a three pound rate of zinc versus one pound of, of mass or one, one pound of zinc with a mass. So if, if you put out three pounds, basically if you put out three pounds of zinc uh, versus your normal 10 pounds, I guess that still slowly would raise your soil zinc levels a little bit. But uh, I think you said four years of applying 10 pounds of actual zinc through zinc sulfate would be enough to raise your soil levels up into the optimum level if you were at, lo at, at the low levels to begin with? Yeah, so we, we personally have not worked with uh, super zinc, but I think it does become a rate effect. So when you're adding that 10 pounds of actual zinc per acre um, for applications, you know, whether it's in sequence or, you know, every time you have a cereal crop in the rotation, you know, four years will typically build that. Well, if you're cutting that 10 pounds back to a third of that, you know, three pounds, you probably will see some building in your soil test zinc. Uh, it's probably just going to take a significant amount, you know, longer to get into that optimum category where we would no longer recommend a zinc application. Um, but I do think the benefit of those impregnated fertilizers is, is definitely the uniformity of distribution, which, which is an added benefit. Okay, I, I lied, Trent. We're going to have one more question before we go to Dr. Studebaker. Poultry litter, you talked about poultry litter. Is there any appreciable zinc that we're going to get out of poultry litter? Say if we put out two tons of chicken litter, can we expect to get any zinc out of that? Uh, there is going to be some zinc in, in poultry litter. I wouldn't consider it an appreciable amount that we would necessarily count towards uh, zinc management. And it is going to vary greatly just because zinc uh, concentrations in poultry litter are going to be tied to, um, we'll say, the feed additives, uh, you know, the vitamins and minerals that they're adding to the specific chicken um, feed diets. And so if, uh, if you want to get in contact with me, I can get you some more information on that specifically. Uh, but it does vary a little bit more greatly than our macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Okay, great, great. That sounds great, Dr. Roberts. Well, if we do have more fertility questions, we, we'll still have a little bit of time at the end here for uh, Q&A. So we'll go ahead and move on to Dr. Glenn Studebaker. He's our extension entomologist and IPM uh, coordinator and he's going to be discussing corn and grain sorghum insect management. So, Glenn? This is Glenn Studebaker, Extension Entomologist and IPM Coordinator with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service. Today, I'm going to visit with you about insect management in field corn and grain sorghum. We'll start with field corn. There are insects that attack field corn throughout the season, but there are two times during the season that field corn is most susceptible to insect damage and most sensitive. That's during the early stages at the seedling stage and right after the seed is planted, and then the early reproductive stages uh, during ear formation. With corn insect management, there are some things that we can do to avoid uh, high insect populations later in the season. Uh, one of those things is to plant early. Uh, planting early does avoid those higher populations of corn earworm and southwestern corn borer that tend to be a bigger problem later in the season. If a borer plants his crop early enough, he can avoid these populations when they, when they build up. Another thing, because uh, there are so many soil insects, that attack corn roots and the corn seed after it's planted, using a seed treatment or infro insecticide can help to minimize uh, those problems. And also as well as suppress uh, seedling pests such as chinch bug and some stink bug species. And finally, what uh, growers need to do if they plant non-BT corn is uh, manage southwestern corn borer, which is one of the more destructive pests of, of non-BT corn in Arkansas. Let's talk about corn seed treatments. 
all corn corn comes with a, a base C treatment of uh, the 250 rate, which is usually adequate for most soil insect pests in most years. Uh, generally, we have areas that have wireworms. Uh, southern corn rootworms vary from year to year. And seed corn maggot is a fairly common one that's in, in most fields most years that uh, growers can't have a problem with. Chinch bugs are seedling pests that uh, attack the plant after it comes up. That used to be a big problem, but uh, we, we rarely see problems with that because of uh, the seed treatments that are used on most of our corn plants. However, if, uh, if a grower is going to plant into a cover crop, they may want to consider going with a higher rate uh, there is a, a, a rate range that a grower can get on his uh, corn seed at planting. And going with the higher 1250 rate, which is 1.25 milligrams of active ingredient per kernel, is really what we recommend if you're going to plant into a cover crop. Uh, cover crops uh, tend to have higher populations of things such as cutworms or stink bugs that can move on to the corn after it emerges. So uh, we generally recommend using one of these higher rates if you're going to plant into a cover crop. Now, talking about stink bugs, they do cause damage to seedling corn, but they can also cause damage later on uh, during that early reproductive stage when the ears are beginning to form. And uh, this can be quite quite damaging if they feed on that newly formed ear just as it's beginning to grow. Uh, once the ear gets to be a larger size and fills in, uh, stink bugs can still feed on it, but they cause a little yield loss. Uh, our treatment level for stink bugs on seedling corn would be if you're seeing about 10% of the plants infested with stink bugs. Uh, corn still needs to be scouted even though there is a seed treatment because seed treatments don't last forever and and uh, heavy populations can sometimes overwhelm those so uh, growers do need to scout those fields. Now at early year uh, formation uh, we drop that uh, level to five percent of an infestation rate uh, because it is a little more damaging and more uh, costly on yield. All right let's switch gears now and talk about corn borers. There are two species of corn borer that occur in Arkansas and attack our field corn. Uh, those are the Southwestern corn borer and the European corn borer. As you can see over here to the uh, top right picture, that is a larvae of a Southwestern corn borer. It's a creamy colored insect, uh, has uh, black spots on it, whereas the uh, European corn borer on the picture below is more of a flesh colored corn borer. Now, our most prevalent the most common species in Arkansas is going to be the Southwestern corn borer, and that's the one we tend to get uh, more problems with in our non-DT corn. Again, remember, this is only a pest of, uh, of non-BT corn. The BT corn hybrids do a very good job of controlling both of these borers. And so we don't really worry about the, having to scout for those if you're growing a BT hybrid. Uh, the main damage from corn borers is going to be stock tunneling, uh, particularly with the southwestern corn borer. Uh, the, uh, the moths will lay their eggs on, on leaves uh, throughout the season. And uh, when the moths, when the uh, caterpillars hatch out of those eggs, they'll feed on the leaves for a little bit, but this really doesn't cause a whole lot of damage to the plant. Uh, after they feed for several days, they will tunnel into the stalk, and that's where they will remain for the remainder of their life. Uh, the stalk, stalk tunneling does interfere with nu nutrient flow in the plant. Also, uh, the main damage that it causes is it weakens the stem, particularly with the southwestern corn borer, because it girdles the stalk from the inside uh, when it becomes full grown very <clears throat> uh, weakening the stem and causing it to, to lodge uh, when heavy winds or other things may come along and, and cause that to happen. Uh, this is really where we see the majority of our yield loss from southwestern corn borers. And now these things overwinter as larvae at the base of the stalk. So at that last generation, uh, the caterpillar burrows down to the base of the stalk that are close to the root system, uh, basically below the soil level and over winters as a larvae. So they're out there right now during this time of year. Uh, because of this behavior, uh, stock destruction is what we do recommend uh, for conventional non-BT corn. Uh, this does help to reduce populations for the next year and can uh, uh, be a good management practice uh, for growers growing non-BT corn. We do not recommend uh, doing no-till uh, of conventional corn behind a field of conventional corn uh, because of uh, this can tend to build up populations of southwestern corn borer. Now, throughout the season, we can monitor for southwestern corn borers, and they can be monitored with a pheromone trap. Uh, the traps, type of trap we use is called a universal trap. It's a, 
a, a bucket type trap. It's not very large. And uh, we like to have those put out in early May to try to uh, determine what those overwinning populations might be like when they emerge. Uh, we do have a threshold based on the uh, uh, number of moths caught per week in a trap. And it varies depending on that first or second generation. But that early generation, because the plants are smaller, uh, we tell growers to consider using a, a, tra a, a trap threshold of about 50 per trap uh, for a week in, in May and early June. Uh, but generally, our, our big populations show up during that second generation, uh, which comes out in late June, early July, depending on what part of the state you're in. That's when we raise that threshold to 100 per trap to plant. And we, uh, we see uh, that, that uh, really a grower doesn't need to worry about uh, southwestern corn borers unless, unless we're approaching that 100 per trap per week. Now, if you're going to use a, a trap, uh, it needs to be utilized properly. Uh, the lure is placed in that little basket at the top of the trap. And then uh, uh, we generally put a kill strip in the lower part in the bucket to kill the moths as they, as they come into the trap. Uh, the way these things work, they emit a pheromone that uh, looks, if you could see it, would look sort of like a plume of smoke coming off that trap, uh, which attracts the uh, the male moths, and then they come in uh, to that, that pheromone and tend to drop down into that bucket, and kill strip kills them, and we can, we can count them. One thing to remember, uh, there are several sources of pheromone, and there are actually two different manufacturers. The, uh, the Hercon-type pheromone comes in a strip, and it does not stay in that little uh, lure basket very well. It tends to fall out. So you need to use a paper clip or rubber band or something to hold it in there. Now, some of the other pheromone uh, types uh, will stay in there, and, and we don't have that much problems with those. But uh, that is something to keep in mind. Pheromone lasts about two to three weeks and should be uh, changed because it won't last forever. Uh, another thing to remember is where you place the traps. We like to place the traps around the field, but not in the field. Uh, they need to have good airflow. They also need to keep the, the uh, in an area where the weeds will not take over. Uh, when you get a lot of vegetation growing around the trap, it does interfere with that pheromone being able to be uh, detected by the moths. So you need to have it in an open area uh, around the field border somewhere, uh, preferably near a, a high line pole or a, a post of some sort uh, so that they're knocked down, knocked down by equipment. All right, another thing uh, that... Uh, uh, a grower or whoever's monitoring the traps needs to be aware of is uh, to be able to recognize the southwestern corn borer moth. Uh, the, uh, the moths are uh, about a half inch to an inch long and they're a cream color. They have no markings on the back or on the wings. Other species uh, such as bowler moths in particular sometimes will get into traps uh, but we don't count those moths. You want to only count the southwestern corn borer moths. Sometimes I've seen army worm uh, moths and others that we may make their way into the trap. Perhaps they're contracted to color. The pheromone may uh, attract a few of them if it's similar to their own pheromone for that species. Uh, another thing to remember, make sure you're using the right pheromone uh, if you're putting it in a trap. We have had instances where uh, someone was running more than one species, running bollworm traps, and they put the wrong pheromone in the core borer trap. And when they counted it, it uh, had a lot of, of moths in it and they uh, thought they were corn borer moths when actually they were bollworm moths because they put the wrong, wrong uh, pheromone in the trap. So please be aware of that when you're putting the traps out. Uh, these tools work great, but only if we use them correctly. Uh, most of our counties uh, have county agents that are running at least a few traps uh, where uh, conventional corn or non-BT corn is, is being grown. Now we have had conventional corn or non-BT corn grown in the state for, for several years now and uh, acreage has been increasing. And as a consequence, it's not, not surprising that we're beginning to see higher, higher populations in some of the surrounding counties. Uh, Woodruff and Jackson County or Monroe County, those, that area has been kind of a hot spot over the years for southwestern corn, but we're beginning to see those numbers kind of move out. As the uh, amount of conventional uh, non-BT corn has grown in the state, uh, we will uh, probably see uh, numbers spreading and see populations increase as well. So it's very important that we get out there and uh, utilize these traps. They're easy to use, uh, not real expensive, and they do a good job of telling us uh, when we might have uh, populations in the field. Uh, we also uh, post these trap catches on our Arkansas uh, row crops blog. Uh, you can find those uh, 
alerts as they come out. And uh, as you can see, there's a, a link there you can click on that'll actually show the, the trap catches. But uh, look at that as the season progresses, you can see uh, what's coming on. Now, if a grower does have high numbers and needs to treat, there are several uh, different options that the grower can use. Uh, we tend to recommend using some insecticides that may have a, a longer residual. If you have one that's put out with a two to three week residual, uh, putting it out about the time those uh, trap catches hit high, will have that insecticide out there uh, at egg hatch or before the eggs hatch, which is very important. Uh, once that moth or that caterpillar goes into the stem and burrows into the stem, uh, you uh, you can't control it with an insecticide. So we need to make sure the insecticide's out there long enough, which is why these longer residual insecticides uh, do a little better job. You don't have to have your timing down quite as, as close as you do if you use a pyrethroid or one of these others as a short residual. Those would have to be put out right about the time the eggs are laid in order to really control, whereas the uh, longer residual products could be put out a little bit earlier and are still going to be out there. Uh, there are some uh, not necessarily new insecticides, new active ingredients, but some new formulations that are available. Uh, Elevist and Vantacore are two uh, newer products this year. Uh, again, they're uh, similar to Besiege and Prevathon in that they both contain chloranthinolaprol. The Elevist has a, has a pyrethroid in there with it as well, kind of like Besiege does or the Intrepids, and there's quite a few uh, generics uh, that uh, we have listed below that you can see that are also available. Uh, any of these give a, a fairly good residual as far as controlling uh, corn borers. Now, uh, that's really uh, what you want to look at in, in non-BT corn. Uh, if you're playing BT corn, it gives excellent corn borer control, and we really don't worry about corn borers. Uh, but what are the benefits of BT corn outside of corn borer control? Uh, you know, there, in the past, we did see some corn earworm control, some far lumbering worm control, uh, but uh, we're starting to see that's kind of dropping off and not working as well. Uh, what are the advantages? You know, one of the disadvantages to BT corn is it does cost some money, particularly with the, uh, with the, with the uh, stack traits. And we are beginning to see some resistance in corn airworm and fall armyworm uh, to the BTs. So uh, that could be a problem. Uh, these are most of our common uh, products that are available in Arkansas. We have the uh, single gene, the Herculex, Agrisur, uh, corn borer, and Yogard, which have one uh, BT gene. And then there are the stack traits with uh, two BTs, uh, the double pros, Intersect, uh, and then and Smart Stacks and PowerCore have three. Uh, none of these have the VIP gene in them. And uh, then we have the Agrisur, Viptera, Leptra, and Tricepta that have the, the VIP gene and, uh, and the VIP uh, protein, which is a little more active against some of these other species. But then again, do we really need those? Because uh, since our primary target is corn borer, and all of these products do a, a good job of controlling corn borer. Do we really need to control corn earworm in corn? Well, it does look bad when you peel into your back and you see uh, earworm feeding on the kernel. Uh, we tend to think maybe it's causing some yield loss, uh, when in reality, it, it really may not. Uh, we're putting tremendous pressure on these products uh, because the majority of our corn earworm do go through our field corn because of the way the, the season progresses, and then they move to other crops uh, in successive generations. These are some uh, uh, hybrids that were planted at Kaiser. Uh, that first bar uh, is a non-BT uh, hybrid, as you can see. You're, it's not uncommon to find 70, 80%, even 100% ear damage from corn earworm. Uh, the double pro right there next to it is showing the same level, actually a little higher damage than the uh, non-BT. Uh, so what we're seeing is that these uh, typical BT hybrids do not do no longer control a corn earworm and give us any suppression. Uh, the last three there are all VIP type hybrids and they are giving us some control. Uh, it used to be we found zero damage on these. Now we're starting to see some. Uh, if you look at some of our other locations, we're actually seeing a little bit higher le uh, damage levels in some of these. Uh, and that's what we used to see with the Double Pro when it first came out. And now you look at it, it looks no different than an OBT. So, uh, our fear is that we're going to begin to see dev resistance developing to Viptera. And while we just said that corn earworm does not really cause any yield loss in field corn, uh, it can be a problem for our other, other uh, BT crops such as cotton, and where the corn earworm is much more damaging. 
because these populations do go to cotton. Again, here's what a, a location in Pine Bluff, as you can see, double pro 100% uh, damage, just like uh, a non-BT. Uh, so pretty much got resistance in, uh, in these uh, uh, BT hybrids uh, to with the corn earworm. Uh, there's also another effect of BT on corn earworm. Uh, corn earworm tend to be cannibalistic uh, on the corn, and uh, on a conventional ear, you'll seldom see more than two on a, on an ear because they eat each other. However, when they feed on uh, sublethal doses of BT toxins you know, you know, on an ear, uh, we do see that they become less cannibalistic, and you may find as many as three to five on an ear. Uh, so there is a, a little change in their behavior. So what do we recommend? You know, one thing we do want to stress is follow the refuge when you plant your uh, your BT corn. Uh, even though these do a great job of controlling corn borer, uh, there have been a few instances where we've seen resistance popping up in other parts of the country uh, in, in, uh, in corn borers. So the refuge, uh, planting a refuge should help with that. The uh, single genes, 50% refuge, all the others are 20%. And we're really... Uh, leaning towards uh, having growers try to avoid using a VIP variety uh, or a VIP hybrid if they can because of the effect that this is having on corn air with the resistance developing on that they're the same proteins that are used in BT cotton and if we see uh, resistance pop up in the VIP uh, because of the pressure put on it in corn uh, it's going to really cause us some trouble for those growers who grow cotton uh, later on. As I said, we uh, really don't see any yield loss from corn earworm, uh, predominantly because corn earworm feeds at the tip of the ear, and uh, we see the majority of our damage. Uh, but that ear tip really contributes maybe 12% uh, of the total yield. In some st studies that we did, and these were hand-shelled ears, uh, the most that the ear tip contributed was 12% to the total yield. And it's actually, I think, less than that because we counted every kernel, all those tiny kernels wind up blowing out the back of the combine. So I think probably more like less than 10% of the yield is actually in the tip, which is where that earworm is feeding. So what are some things to consider uh, as far as growing corn and insect management? Again, avoid no-till practices and non-BT field corn uh, if the history of southwestern corn borers there. Use a higher seed treatment rate if you're planting behind a grass cover crop in particular, follow the refuge requirements. And as we say in all crops, scout them weekly, uh, use pheromone traps for southwestern corn borer and non-BT corn, and utilize our thresholds and treat only if you necessarily have to. All right, let's switch gears now and talk about uh, grain sorghum insect pests. Uh, there are a lot of insects that feed on grain sorghum. Uh, this is the list here. Uh, even though there's a lot out there, there are several that are really the ones that we're concerned with. Um, sugar cane aphid was one that showed up about five, six years ago, and it's now a, a yearly problem for uh, sorghum growers. And then our head feeders, uh, especially sorghum midge, and then the caterpillar uh, complex that feed on, on the heads are really what we're going to concentrate on as we talk about uh, insects and sorghum. What are those head feeders? Sorghum midge, which is a, a tiny little insect, and we'll talk about it, can cause quite a few problems. Uh, earworms, fall worm, webworm, stink bugs, and then the sugarcane aphid uh, feeds on all parts of the plant, but also gets on the head, and that's really where it causes quite a few problems. Let's talk about sorghum midge first. Uh, sorghum midge is uh, one of the most important pests of grain sorghum, can cause drastic uh, losses in yield. It's a tiny little orange insect. Uh, this is what they look like. It's a tiny fly. They're not very big, but they are bright orange in color, so they're not too hard to identify. Uh, they only attack sorghum during the firing stage, so they're easy to scout for. In that, in that respect, there's just one time we're really looking for them. Uh, prior to bloom, they're not a problem. Uh, once the uh, crop is done blooming, they're not a problem. So really, it's during this yellow anther stage that we look for, for midge out there uh, attacking the sorghum. Life cycle lasts uh, about two to three weeks, but the adults only live for about uh, 24 hours. They don't feed. Basically, they may lay eggs and then they die. Uh, then the larvae hatches inside that seed, feeds on it, and uh, uh, hollows it out and causes yield loss. They also feed on, on Johnson grass, so that's uh, a source of them for 
for uh, uh, our grain sorghum. Um, there is an effect on yield. Uh, we see our highest uh, 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 yield loss uh, in uh, around 20% of uh, uh, flour. And we base that on when we really want to look for midge out in, in the field. Here's several midge on the, on the head. And they can be quite devastating. Uh, this is a test I had at Kaiser. As you can see where we did not treat, uh, we were down below 20 bushels per acre, whereas the uh, all the insecticides that we used did a pretty good job of controlling uh, sorghum range. They're not hard to control, uh, but timing is an issue. Again, kind of like with corn, uh, planting early does help to avoid populations of sorghum edge. Uh, we do, again, monitor these things during flowering. Our threshold is if you're seeing one to two per head, uh, while uh, when about 25 to 30 percent of the heads in the field are flowering. Uh, usually the, when we do see losses, it's in those later planted fields. And you need to check those fields every uh, few days while it's blooming, uh, because they're only out there for 24 hours. Two or three days later, it's going to be a different crop of uh, midge out there feeding. Although, avoid other algae other automatic applications if you can. Uh, we did get into a, a habit of just uh, spraying fields, over spraying fields that bloom to, to control midge, but this does flare the cotton uh, or the sugar cane aphid, which is a, a devastating insect as well on, on grain sorghum. Let's talk about caterpillars real quick. Uh, there's a complex corn earworm, fall earworm, sorghum, webworm that are the ones that really can cause damage on, on uh, sorghum. Sometimes you'll see this little geometric uh, caterpillar, and that's a picture of it down there. It's called halfling moth. It's really not economic, but you will sometimes see these if you're uh, sampling a, a field. A threshold of, for corn earworm is one or more per head. Uh, usually we want to wait for these larvae to be about half inch long. There's a lot of predators that feed on these. Uh, as far as what to use, Prabathon uh, or Vanticore uh, works pretty well. Uh, Heligen, which is a virus. Now, in that with Heligen, you're going to go after smaller larvae, so probably going to treat before they're half inch long uh, if you use Heligen. And then Lanate like disease. The py pyrethroids do not work well anymore on, on uh, corn earworm and sorghum, so we try to avoid those. Fall armyworm causes the same type of damage. Thresholds the same, one or more per head. Again, half inch long. Uh, stay away from pyrethroids. Same list of insecticides with the exception of helogen. Helogen doesn't work on this particular insect. It's uh, just for corn earworm. Now, a third species is smaller and more hairy. It's a, it's a sorghum webworm. Uh, the treatment for these is five to six per head because they are smaller and they feed a little slower. They don't cause quite as much damage. Again, pyrethroids don't work very well on these e either. A lot of times you'll see a complex uh, webworm. You might see corn earworm and fall armworm all in the same field. Let's talk about sugarcane aphid. Again, this is a, an aphid, but it is very devastating. They can grow, uh, uh, blow up very fast in a field. Uh, start out usually on the leaves on the undersides. As you can see, this leaf is just covered with uh, sugarcane aphid. Uh, and they can cause quite a few problems. Uh, one of the things we need to do as far as sugarcane aphid, you plant early if you can. It helps to, again, avoid some of those populations. Uh, don't plant without a seed treatment. Uh, it does help suppress these things early on and plant an aphid tolerant hybrid if you can find it. Uh, got it. You have to scout the field weekly and monitor uh, two times a week if possible. These things blow up very fast, so you got to really keep keep on top of them and utilize our, our thresholds uh, and treat as soon as threshold is reached. Uh, you don't want to be late on your applications with these things because they do build up so quickly and they can cause some uh, significant problems uh, to your sorghum. All right. Uh, in general, we do have some updates to our recommendations. MP144 insecticide recommendation, recommendations are available now. Uh, they should be at your county office, so contact your uh, your county agent or go by the county office, and you should be able to get the 2021 version that's there. We also have a mobile-friendly version that we launched several years ago. Uh, this is the link that you can you can get to it. Uh, basically, this is this makes it a, a version that shows up on your phone and makes it a little easier to read if you use it. Uh, here's just an example of it. Uh, these are two screenshots from the from the front of a phone. Uh, basically, you uh, can choose your section. We we don't have this for everything, but we do have it for our fruit and nuts, row crops, and uh, our 
our vegetables. And this is just an example. You choose your section, and then your, you'll have a drop down menu of the crops. I chose southern peas here. And you can uh, choose uh, the pests that you're going to treat for. And then over to the right there, as you can see, we have uh, a listing of the insecticides that are recommended, as well as the treatment threshold at the top. Uh, if you'll uh, if you click on the little pluses to the to the right there, it'll expand and give you what the formulation per acre is, uh, REI, and all the information that you need: minimum base to harvest, IRAC code, which is our uh, resistance code. Uh, if you want to uh, rotate chemistries. I use a product with a different number each time to help stave off resistance and then all the application comments as well. You know, often there's, if there's a, if there are generics, they'll give you a list of the generic uh, options that are also available. All right, if you all have any questions, uh, this is the contact information for the extension entomologist uh, in Arkansas with our phone numbers and email addresses. Uh, we all work in, in all the row crops. Uh, so you should be able to find and get hold of one of us if you have any any questions. That uh, will conclude my presentation on uh, corn and grain sorghum insect management. All right. Well, well, thank you, Glenn. Great information. So if you if you have some questions, go ahead and enter them into the Q and A box. Not just for Dr. Studebaker, but any of our speakers. And so. Glenn, I've, I've got a couple questions for you here. First one uh, was in the Q&A box. How many southwestern corn borer pheromone traps per acre do we need? So, you know, if we got a 40 acre field or 80 acre field, how, how many traps do we need or how many would you recommend? That's, a, that's an excellent question. And uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, <laughs> uh, basically, what we really kind of try to look at is, is monitoring an area. Uh, so if there's, if there's just one field in an area, if it's like an 80 acre field or a 40 acre field, I'd say put them a minimum of two traps out, uh, one on, on the opposite ends of the field, uh, because, uh, traps sometimes aren't effective on one side, but they're more effective on another. A lot of environmental conditions affect that. Uh, but you know, if I had a block of 200 acres, I'd, you know, you could probably get by with four or five traps, you know, so it kind of depends on what you're looking at. Uh, but I would say a minimum of one per field. Uh, and yeah, like I said, if, if it's just like one field out there by itself, you'd want a minimum of two just to get an average of what's in that, what's in that area. So Glenn, this is, this is still related to traps. Um, so we only put corn board traps on conventional corn. There's, there's no need to put traps around BT corn, correct? That's correct. Uh, the corn borers will not survive on BT corn. So, uh, you can put a trap there, but you're probably not going to catch any corn borers. Uh, and even if you do, uh, that information, you know, it, it's there, but it's it, you're not going to make any management decisions based on that because you don't need to spray a BT cornfield. Uh, all the B, all of the BT hybrids do an excellent job of, of uh, controlling BT uh, southwestern and European corn borers. Okay, another message that or question that was texted to me. So we hear a lot about. BT or, or insect resistance to insecticides. So what, what about resist corn borer resistance to our BT corn? Are we, are we seeing any of that? Should we con be concerned about that yet? Uh, yeah, there's been a few pockets, uh, little blips here and there and, and other parts of the, of the country uh, where we've seen uh, some European or, and some Southwestern corn borers make it through one of the single trait uh, BTs. But it's just been uh, kind of uh, uh, something that showed up and it's never really taken hold. Uh, so far, our, our, our BT hybrids are really holding up very well and controlling southwestern corn borer. So it's, it's not a thing that we, we worry a lot about, but because there has been a blip or two, there is the potential for that. It is important that growers follow the, uh, the refuge requirements for these, these hybrids, you know, like I had in the, in the presentation, you know. A lot of the double stack traits, uh, you know, a 20% refuge is, is what's required. And that really is to stave off resistance in, in corn borers. And it will help with maybe a further development of resistance in corn earworm, and especially to VIP. It's pretty much got resistance to the other BTs now. So uh, I think that ship has completely sailed now. Okay. Next question here is still relating to corn earworm damage. So I think you said earlier in your, your presentation, 12% damage. I, I think that's maybe what you'd said. 
So with that level of damage in, even though it may be BT corn or conventional corn, is that, that amount of damage economical, especially now that, uh, you know, most producers are, are hoping they're going to get $5 or more for the grain. So more grain, better grain prices, maybe people more willing to spend money. Should they be spending it trying to control earworms in corn? Uh, yeah, I, I did have that, that 10, 12%. Uh, and what that was really talking about is most of the earworm damage is on the tip of the ear. And where we had done some studies where we, we hand shelled the ears and that, that tip of the ear in a hand shelled situation where we collected every kernel off the tip uh, gave us about 12% of the yield, contributes about 12% to the yield. So I would say really yield loss is much less than that. We've done several studies where we sprayed some plots and eliminated earworms and led some uh, supply side by side where we let the earworms eat and uh, we couldn't measure any yield loss. Uh, and I, the reason for that, I believe is because of they feed at that ear tip and a lot of those small kernels at the ear tip, even on a, in a, a clean ear will blow out the back of the combine because those kernels are so, so small. So uh, I think that that tip probably contributes less than 10% to yield. But so you, you, you put all that together and they don't eat every tip, uh, kernel off the tip of the ear. So uh, there's just, we have had a hard time measuring any yield loss from, in field corn from corn earworm. And it's not just here. Uh, there's been some entomologists in other states have, have tried to look at that and still not really seen that. We're really, the, where we've mechanically moved uh, kernels uh, to try to see how much we have to remove to cause uh, yield loss, you've got to remove close to 100 kernels per ear. And uh, they generally don't eat that many uh in there because of the way they they feed okay uh got two questions here both of them involve heligen so uh one consultant used heligen and grain sorghum in the past and after they used it uh, they'd see a big jump in corn earworm and sorghum webworm the next two weeks what what, what do we need to do different or how do we need to use heligen to, uh, to get the best results well, uh, and, and heligen is not going to have any effect on sorghum webworm uh, is one for one thing. So it's, it's not surprising that you're going to see sorghum webworm behind a heligen application. It is specific to corn earworm. Uh, really, the, the, to get the best results, you know, because this is a virus and it takes some time for it to work, uh, what we look at is, is really you want to apply it early if you're going to use it. And, uh, you know, our thresholds for other insecticides, we want to wait till those, those worms are a half inch long because there's a lot of predators in the field before we make an application. With heligen, you're not going to wait that long because it takes some time to work. So you're really looking at, at newly hatched or quarter inch worms. Uh, it's probably going to be the most effective. And, uh, and you know, right at threshold, if you've got a heavy population, it's, it may not work as well. So you're really kind of looking at applying it early at a little lower lower threshold uh, i would say probably one per per two heads instead of one per head is what i would i would say we would probably lean more towards that for putting out heligen to make it work the other question on heligen is you know if we put put it out early how long will we residual or how long can we expect the heligen to be active i guess provided we have worms out there during that time right yeah, you got to have worms. It's a virus. Uh, you know, that has, the way it reproduces in the field is it reproduces in those worms. So if it's a clean field and there's no worms, you'll have a little residual. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of that plays into, because it is a virus, how hot it is, uh, solar radiation and all that kind of stuff, the, the kind of things that will break a virus down. So, you know, under cloudy conditions, if it's a little bit cooler, you might see a, a week or two of uh, residual with it. Uh, with with no worms there if you got a low population of worms you, we've seen residual last for quite some time but again that, that this all depends you have to have with worms there to actually uh, build the virus up in the field so uh, it's, it's a game you got to play with with that particular product okay well i think that's all the questions that i currently have does anybody else have any quite last minute questions before we uh, wrap up the program today Okay, well, maybe, maybe we're at the end here, and uh, I want to thank the Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Producers, the Arkansas Corn and Grain Sorghum Promotion Board, and all of our industry partners. The work we do would not be possible without their support. So 
if you asked a question or, or think of a question a little bit later that uh, you thought I should have asked that question, feel free to email me, call me. Uh, I think you've got my contact info information. My email is jkelly, J-K-E-L-L-E-Y at uaex.edu. And so we can get you an answer and uh, wish everybody a great 2021 year and appreciate everybody being on online today. So thank you. And uh, this concludes our presentation and have a great afternoon.